what we are are avatars of the one. The one awareness is exploring all of its possibilities through different avatars. So somehow there is this field of awareness that is in some sense deeply and fundamentally who you really are. What do you think about the AI scientists that signed the paper saying that we need to slow AI down because, and I had one of them on the show, because it passed a Turing test faster than they thought, it's just moving faster than they expected and they're very worried. Do you think that AI will ever become conscious? I'm actually not too worried about AI right now myself. So I'm not one of the alarmists that, that says we need to stop and worry about it. The thing that would alarm me more would be if there were some kind of law that criminalized most people from doing it and let a few people do it, a few mm -hmm. companies do it. That, that, that alarms me. So if there's going to be any kind of laws, they should be universal and no one should be excluded. Is that? But why, right, why aren't you worried about AI? It's pretty easy even with ChatGPT to, to give it questions it can't answer right now. It's, it's basically a good statistical analyzer. It's not deeply intelligent. It will find things that we humans won't find in, in, in medical searches, you know, and so forth. But um, that's because it, it just can handle more data and, and do more statistical analysis than we can. But it's not deeply intelligent. And the, the founders would, would tell you that. It's, it's fairly straightforward kinds of algorithms. So, and in terms of consciousness, there is no theory right now of any kind that can ex start with physical systems like circuits, software, and explain even one specific conscious experience, how it arises. So I'll be very, very clear. There's no theory on the planet today that can start with um, an artificial intelligence and a description of some kind of circuit or some kind of software pattern of activity and can give you a specific conscious experience like the taste of chocolate or the smell of garlic, where you would say this pattern of activity must be identical, must be the taste of chocolate. It could not be the smell of, of a rose. There's nothing on the table and there's nothing even close. So if AIs can be conscious, there are no theories right now at all that could explain how that could possibly be and nothing that makes it even plausible. So, so I'm not too, too worried about AIs being conscious. I think that they will eventually outperform humans in, in, in most everyday activities, uh, but simply because they'll have more compute power and can search more deeply than, than we can. Will, so for people that don't know you, um, I'm gonna give a super brief synopsis and by all means put in where I go awry here, but you believe that this is all a simulation. We are living in a simulation. None of this is real. Space time itself is not real. We are effectively living inside of what you call the headset, right. that everything you've ever known or ever experienced is all effectively an illusion. It is a computer video game by way of analogy. Right. Given that, and, and audience listening at home, you will notice he did not say no. So, um, <laughs> and this is something I've, I have forever just dismissed out of hand that we're living in a simulation. And I say dismissed out of hand because I don't have any evidence to back it up. And I've heard all the arguments uh, from a mathematical perspective that if you believe that humans are capable of creating um, photorealistic simulations and you give any rate of progress whatsoever, we will eventually create a simulation. We certainly with AI and how rapidly it's been advancing, I think people now really have a sense of, whoa, we really are gonna be able to do this. Uh, Apple Vision Pro certainly gives an indication like you will really be able to create some very compelling, very realistic um, things inside of a, a visor. So I think people more now more than ever could see how we could get into a simulation, a simulated world that's convincing. I'll leave it at that. And if that's true, then why would we then, once we create that simulation, not create another simulation? And I will just tell you, as somebody, the t-shirt that I'm wearing is literally about this. We're building a, a game that we hope over time will be a truly simulated world that people will go in, they will have an identity inside that game. Okay, so if we know that loop exists, then once the game inside the game gets powerful enough, it will do another simulation. Once the game inside that game, inside that game gets powerful enough, it will do a simulation. And so you end up in this point where just mathematically, it would make more sense to believe that you're in one of those, you know, conceivably infinite um, recursive loops of a simulation than that you're in base reality. But it just always seemed weird to me 
to say, no, 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 we're in one of the simulations. But the more I research you, the more I'm like, maybe we really are in a simulation. And to that point, you talk about consciousness as being fundamental. And so I'll need you to explain that for people that that will be so jarring. It will take them a while to really grok that. But that consciousness is fundamental. So couldn't AI ever become a window into what you call a conscious agent in the same way that a human child is or a dog is or whatever? That I think is possible. Absolutely. So if you don't mind, walk walk people through how it could be possible mm -hmm. that physicality, everything they see, touch, taste, the loves that they have, all of that is a simulation and not fundamental, meaning it, right. it arises out of something else. But consciousness is the, is the fundamental. The, yeah, the foundation. Well, there are two arguments for the idea that um, what we see is not an objective reality that exists independent of us and is there prior to when we look at it. So in physics, the Nobel Prize last December was given to three physicists for the experimental testing of a clean prediction of quantum theory that something called local realism is false. Local realism is the claim that physical objects like electrons have definite so realism is the claim that an electron has a definite value of position, momentum, and spin when it's not observed. And locality is the claim that those properties have influences that propagate through space-time no faster than the speed of light. And the conjunction of those two claims, the properties exist even when they're not perceived, even when they're not measured, and they have influences that propagate no faster than the speed of light, that's local realism, and local realism is false. How do they prove it? So that's why you get a Nobel Prize. So <laughs> John Clauser, Anton Zeilinger, and, and um, Alan Aspect, over decades, there's a, a string of, of, of experiments that were tighter and tighter. Each experiment closed loopholes in the previous ones. So the experiments have to deal with, they're, they're complicated experiments. I mean, Zeilinger was actually using photons from outer space <clears throat> to get entangled um, particles that, that they could use that you could ar couldn't argue that they were somehow you know being connected or correlated some in some deep way but basically <clears throat> the, the the experiments are set up to show that properties like position or momentum or spin typically they, they like to use spin um, in principle could not have definite values until you actually measured them mm -hmm. so one way that they do this mathematically are there these bell inequalities and so if if the statistics of the correlations between the particle spins, you have two different particles that you're measuring the spin axis, for example. And if they had definite values, even when you weren't observing, you'd have certain pattern of correlation. And if <clears throat> quantum mechanics is right, and those values don't exist until you measure them, then you have a different pattern of correlation. And so that's what they, they do. They have to look at a bunch of different measurements, look at the correlations, and the correlations come out to be what's, what quantum theory predicts mm -hmm. and not what our classical intuitions would tell us. And so the this was done by Clauser decades ago, but it's so counterintuitive that people are going, okay, well, there must be a loophole here. So then they closed a series of loopholes. And finally, they started getting photons from like distant galaxies where the photons couldn't possibly have certain within space-time um, causal connections and close that loophole. And um, so that's one, one, one direction. So physicists tell us that local realism, at least for microscopic, you know, subatomic particles, recently they've gotten up to groups of 700 um, atoms, I believe. So it's, it's starting to, they're, they're showing that these effects, um, so these superposition effects of quantum theory are not just at the very, very small end of things. So local realism is false. Now one can still try to say, well, but that's for really tiny things, but at the macroscopic level, maybe lo local realism is true. And that leads to a problem because there's no principal distinction in quantum theory between the microscopic and the macro. You can't say at 10 to the minus, you know, 20 centimeters, that's, you know, that's 
that's the limit. You know, there's, there's no boundary between micro and macro. Mm. So, and this is a, a well-known open problem. So that's one direction. I'll just go with that. Now, the, um, the, the other direction of argument is from evolution by natural selection, where you can ask a technical question. Evolution shapes sensory systems to guide adaptive behavior. So that means to keep you alive long, long enough um, to reproduce, right? So you, you have vision and touch and hearing and smell, and they've been shaped so that um, you're able to get the food you need, mate, and stay alive at least long enough to reproduce and, and pass your genes on to the next generation. That's the standard story of evolution. Many theorists also think that evolution shapes our sensory systems to tell us truths about objective reality. Like, when I see an apple, that's because there really is an apple, and the, the red color and the shape really exist, even when they're not perceived. And so that's, notice that's a step beyond just saying that our senses evolved to guide adaptive behavior. They're, they want to say more than that. They want to say that if you guide adaptive behavior, you're going to see the truth. So, so I decided with my colleagues, Chaitan Prakash and Manish Singh and Robert Prentner and others, um, my graduate students, Justin Mark and Brian Marion, um, to, to test this. Um, you know, evolution is a mathematically precise theory. We have evolutionary game theory. So there's a technical question. What is the probability? that um, evolution by natural selection would shape any sensory system to see truths about objective reality, the structure of objective reality. And um, it's straightforward to prove. Um, what, what we do is we look at various kinds of so-called fitness payoff functions, um, maybe payoff functions that are, that are, and we can ask, do these payoff functions preserve certain kinds of structures in the world, like, um, Orders, a total order, or, or a, a partial order, or a metric, or a topology, or, or a measurable structure. So we can say, we don't know what objective reality is, but suppose it had this structure. What is the probability that fitness payoffs, which govern our evolution, would actually have information about that structure in the world so that, that we could actually be evolved to have some insight into that structure of objective reality? And in case after case, the answer is um, the probability is zero. The, there, there are payoff functions that would preserve the structure, but those payoff functions have probability zero in the set of all payoff functions. So, so that means if you're a betting man, um, you would bet long odds against it. So it doesn't mean that it can't happen, it's just that the probability is, is zero. And so I take this as a convergence between two of our big theories in science, evolution by natural selection and quantum theory, quantum field theory. Both are telling us that local realism is false. And so, so I think a good metaphor then is, as you were saying, um, like a user interface or a, or a video game where you render on the fly what you need. So I'm looking at you, I'm rendering a Tom face, and I look away, and I'm not rendering it. Someone else might be looking at you, and they're rendering their Tom face, but, but their Tom face is not the same as mine. It's going to be at a different angle and so forth. So we render on the fly, and that's what physics is telling us, basically, that local realism is false. We render on the fly. And so the, where you're taking that from is the quantum uncertainty principle, basically. Everything has a probability of being in a given state. And the reason that it's just a big question mark uh, is because nothing's looking at it. So it does not need to render that. It doesn't need to decide. The system, which is the simulation, um, which people think of as space-time, but they're almost certainly, I've interviewed you so many times and I know how hard it is to escape uh, this matrix, but... They're thinking of things within space-time being real, but once you start looking at space-time as purely a simulation and that the then rendering only happens when you look at something. So that to me makes a hypothesis that I think your data backs up, which if that were really the case, then um, I understand why big things would adhere to what seem like a different set of rules where things are static and small things would not because it, you're far less likely to observe a first order consequence of something microscopic. You may be observing a second or third order consequence, which raises questions for me that I'm sure we will get to at some point, but just to close the loop on that. So first order consequence, I can look up and see the moon. I see 
planets. I see stars. And so for that to be persistent, which is going to be a big thing in, in our discussion today, this is like the prime thing I want to talk to you about is persistence and what that means. But big things will need to be persistent. And therefore, there has to be, there is a constant collapsing of its probabilities uh, because there are so many things that require, even if it's just its effects on gravity, there's so many things, quote unquote, witnessing that or measuring that. So I get why those would be stable. But then things where they're so small that there's very little that hinges on that, that, that would need to be directly rendered. That would need to, because you can get away with sort of the probabilistic rendering of the big things and their um, influence by these smaller things. But you don't need a direct representation of the spin, for instance, uh, of a particle that that all things that would quote unquote measure it don't see, don't interact with or whatever, because nobody's effectively looking at it. It does not need to be rendered. Right. So a good so Did that all feel right just to... No, or, that's a great question. And, and so Great question. I was not asking a question. I was stating a hypothesis. About Do you think I'm crazy or no, I think does, does that make sense at the macro to the micro level? Well, it, it, it does, but I think a good analogy here that might help clarify the, the issue is, is, so in, say, Grand Theft Auto, right? I look over, I'm playing with somebody who's you know in Canada and somebody else is in Europe and someone else is in China. We're all playing a remote version of it. And virtual reality. And I look over and I see a red Porsche to my right. And so I say, is there a red Porsche on my right? And the guy in China says, oh, yeah, I see a red Porsche. And the guy in Canada agrees and the guy in Europe agrees as well. So, of course, each of them is rendering their own red Porsche. So there is some reality that's coordinating all of these perceptions, right? So the guy in Canada didn't see a red Porsche until he looked. But when he looked, um, there was... the this whole world you know, of circuits and software that you don't see. There's some supercomputer that's coordinating the whole thing. How's it coordinating? In that particular metaphor, right, the, there's a supercomputer that's, that's taking the inputs from like your headset. What, what direction are you looking with your headset? Maybe you've got a bodysuit, so it's looking at your arm movements and so forth. And it's feeding all that into a supercomputer where it's got a model of the game. And in that model, there's some red portion model. Of course, there's no red portion in the computer. And it knows then how to coordinate and send the photons to your headset in Canada and my headset in Irvine and someone else's headset in, in China so that we have this notion of a persistent reality of a Porsche, even though individually for each one of us, um, local realism is false. The Porsche doesn't even exist until I render it. And there's no red Porsche inside the supercomputer. So that's sort of the idea is that's, that space-time is just a headset, and there's behind space time, there's going to be an incredibly complicated realm to explore that's as least as complicated, more complicated as like the supercomputer is to my little headset. The headset is sophisticated, it's beautiful technology, but the supercomputer is you know, a really, really powerful thing. And the same thing will be true of space time. It's just our headset, but if we look beyond that headset, we're gonna, you know, be finding a realm that's far more complicated. So in some sense, science up till now has only studied our headset. We've studied inside space and time. Mm -hmm. We're taking our first baby steps to start to explore. We, we've, we've cut our teeth in science on, on studying our headset. We learned the tools in the last three or 400 years about experiments and clean mathematical theories and the loop between experiments and theories. But we thought we were studying objective reality. We were studying our headset. But now we have the tools to actually take a first step beyond space-time and start to find structures beyond space-time and their projection back into space-time. And so from that point of view, our view that objects in space-time, um, we've taken that to be the fundamental reality, will look sort of parochial, um, hopefully in just a few decades. We'll, yeah, I think the next generation where um, many people will have spent a lot of time in virtual reality my generation didn't spend a lot of time in virtual reality. So this is a hard concept. But if you've spent- I don't, I've heard you say that before. I don't think that's going to get people where you think it's going to get them. Maybe not. Uh, but in this episode, I want to try to explain why mm -hmm. I think that and, and get um, your take. So here's what I think we need to do first, and then we'll go okay. even deeper. There's two things we need to do in the near term. Um, one, I think we- we need to, in, in our previous um, interviews, we spent a lot of time dealing with the headset. So for anybody that's sort of confused on that idea of you're living in a simulation, 
everything that you know and love and touch and have ever experienced, it is all a simulation. You have never existed outside of the headset. So if right there, your brain breaks, go watch the other episodes. We spend a <laughs> tremendous amount of time building that right, up. Right. Um, but for now, what I want to do is say, okay. okay, I'm going to assume that you get it, that your whole life is basically Grand Theft Auto. Okay. And yeah. people understand it. You've been in there playing the game and they understand the difference between playing the game and the computer um, rules and things that give birth to that game. And so that's that's the difference. What I wanna do now is map that one layer back. So I wanna take that idea of your life is Grand Theft Auto, but there's this thing called space time that's outside of it and get to what you're actually saying, which is that same relationship, but move back one very profound level. Because what it does is it inverts everything. And what it says is that the universe the universe, space-time, is an emergent phenomenon from consciousness. That consciousness is in this, to use that analogy, just to map it back, that consciousness is the quote-unquote computer and rules of the system. And then the simulation is what we all think of as real life. Okay, so that's where we're mapping. So right, one, sure. does, does that track for you that we can move that analogy sort of one rung deeper is probably the word you'd be most comfortable with. Right, so absolutely. A model in which we take consciousness as fundamental and we have a mathematical model of consciousness and we then try to show how space-time gets rendered from that, absolutely. Okay, perfect. You can reboot your life, your health, even your career, anything you want. All you need is discipline. I can teach you the tactics that I learned while growing a billion dollar business that will allow you to see your goals through. Whether you want better health, stronger relationships, a more successful career, any of that is possible with the mindset and business programs in Impact Theory University. Join the thousands of students who have already accomplished amazing things. Tap now for a free trial and get started today. So now in this interview, instead of making our references to Grand Theft Auto, unless we need to for whatever, for an anchor point, I want to talk about space-time okay. like a simulation. Okay. I want to sure. talk about space-time like it is Grand Theft Auto because researching you this time, I, I want to sit with it for a while before I start saying I'm 100% behind it. And okay. I mentioned one of our previous interviews that I do revert to the mean after I spend time with you, but each time you're, you're <laughs> shifting me farther where my mean is sort of closer to you. Mm -hmm. This time, at least in the research, I had a real sense of he's right. Hmm. I, I don't know about the, the consciousness is the only part that we may disagree, sure. but that I, you really gave me an internally consistent set of logic points for why space time is the simulation. And when I grant you a few base assumptions that we'll go through, my own worldview makes more sense. Okay. And so I realized for the first time, again, fully acknowledging that I may revert to the mean once I've interviewed three or four other people on totally different <laughs> topics and this is sort of cleared my system. But right now as we do this, I really felt like you improved what I consider a prediction engine. I think of the human mind as a prediction engine and the closer you get to baseline truth, the more you're able to predict the outcome of your behaviors. What I'm watching happening with AI, which is why I wanted to start there, mm -hmm. I can't make sense. I don't, when I think about a hallucinating AI, I'm like, I don't understand. When I think about AI pulling patterns out of noise, I don't understand. When persistence is difficult for AI, I don't understand. And then I research you and click, click, click. Those pieces fall into place when I assume that it's all already a simulation and that AI is simply revealing to me how the simulation works. And so, but the fact that we disagree, or maybe we don't, I think AI will be windows into consciousness. I think AI is leveraging your own theories what? to create AI right now as we're talking about it. I think I'm a lay person. Everybody needs to take this with a huge grain of salt. Trust me, I am well aware of my limitations. Uh, but I think right now mm -hmm. that what we're witnessing with things like stable diffusion, where AI is creating an image out of the infinite possibilities that exist within this, the, the possibility space of noise. Okay, for people that don't understand how stable diffusion works, that's how it works, is it dips into the noise to find a pattern and then solidifies that pattern to reveal, is this what you wanted? And what I'm saying is when I research you, I realize, oh my God, that's precisely what your theory predicts. 
in the idea of Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which I have struggled with so hard in the previous interviews, I feel bad for everybody that has to watch me go through that. But the more I feel like I can grasp why you keep coming back to it and why this sort of infinite possibility space is so important to understand, when I watch AI pull a static image out of infinite possibility, I'm like, oh my God, that's exactly what you've been trying to describe. Okay, put a pin in that okay. because what I want to talk about now is consciousness as fundamental because this is the part, if people are really paying attention, this is the part that will change your worldview. To, to get into the, the um, space-time as a, as a construct, as a simulation, you first have to understand that you think that's born of the, as born of consciousness itself. And I please, dear audience, stick with this because this point is going to be very important as we piece together the predictions that your own model is going to make. But they have to understand this first. So how is it possible that consciousness, the thing that I think everybody intuits, comes from stacking neurons, 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 and you pass through a cricket, an ant, a mouse, a cat, a dog, a dolphin, a gorilla, and humans. It just feels like, oh, just stack more neurons. And then you're ultimately gonna get these more sophisticated neurons, which give you a more sophisticated consciousness. That seems so self-evident and you're to me. But you're saying, nope. No, and, and by the way, I'll just, on the pin, I'll just mention that I agree with you that AIs could actually give us a window into consciousness, but they won't create consciousness. That was all, that was all I was saying. Interesting. So the, I think we disagree about that. Okay, so, so, so we can go into that. You're so much more thoughtful so much farther ahead. When we get there, I will yeah, lay out my absolutely. ignorant okay. perspective. So on consciousness being fundamental, um, Meaning that's all there is. That, that's right. So the idea would be, um, and this is, by the way, in some sense, not new. Leibniz, in his monadology, um, had the same idea. So I really appreciate that you assume I know what that means. And from context, I can tease it out. But can you tell us what that means? Oh, so, so Leibniz was this genius, um, contemporary of Newton, sort of a antagonistic. They, they both invented calculus at roughly the same time there was a question about who was first and so forth. And they, 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 they were, you know, sort of at each other, but, but they were, say they were contemporaries, but Leibniz um, had this idea that, that consciousness couldn't emerge from physical systems. He has a, a famous argument of the mill where he, he, in one paragraph, basically dismisses the idea that objects inside space and time, like neurons, for example, could create consciousness. For him, it was so obvious that he spent a paragraph on it and moved on. And then he's got a, a book called The Monadology where he was proposing uh, essentially that consciousness perceiving entities are the fundamental reality and that they were interacting. All right, um, if I break down the words monodology? Uh, mo uh, monad, so M-O-N-A-D is a technical term for, it, for him. It, it, was, it. He, it was a new term for him. I, I'm, Monodology is then the book's name, Monodology. Um, and it was basically, it was a dynamics, it was a, a strange dynamics, we called a pre-established harmony where God, so he had he brought God in on, on his thing, I believe, to to sort of coordinate um, all the the perceptions of these. So meaning God was the first mover, the fundamental. Yeah, the, the fundamental. Thing. Right. Okay, right. but he saw it as a creator. Uh, touching things with like a divine spark of consciousness? Yeah, but his ontology was that that um, the fundamental reality beyond space-time was these monads, the, these perceiving entities, basically. And but but God, I think, was that the, was the deepest reality for for Leibniz. Um, there, I'm less secure. Mm -hmm. The monology, I'm not sure exactly what his thoughts were on God, but I believe Fair. that's what he said. Um, so I just brought that up just to say that, you know, we're not the first to, to have this kind of idea. Centuries ago, uh, Leibniz, with his monadology, had an idea that perceiving entities, experiencing entities, could be more fundamental than, than um, the physical space-time world. All right, you talk about conscious agents. Right. Do you mean exactly that same thing? That's right. So conscious agents are um, a, a mathematically precise statement of what we mean by 
consciousness, right? So as a scientist, it's, it's not enough for me just to say, okay, there's consciousness beyond space-time and it's fundamental. I have to write down a mathematical description of what I mean by that. So what aspect of consciousness do I take to be fundamental and, and what's the mathematical description? So if, I was, if you think about it, think about consciousness, there's, of course, experiences, um, there's learning, memory, problem solving, intelligence, maybe free will. Uh, there's lots of things, the, the notion of a self, all these things that you might think a theory of consciousness needs to, to, to incorporate. I'm so sorry, and I, I should have done this before, and that apology goes to the audience. If you're new to Donald, it's probably worth just a quick sentence about what consciousness is. Oh, well, so I would say consciousness is um, the ability to have experiences, like the taste of chocolate, a headache, um, emotions. So this thing feels like something. Yeah, it's, it, the way a lot of philosophers will talk about it is, it's, is to have a conscious experience. There's something it's like to be a conscious entity. It's something. It's, there's something it's like to have a headache. There's something it's like to have your, um, you know, to eat, to have a nice cup of coffee or something like that. Okay, and so let's call that qualia. Again, yes, me right. stealing directly from you. Right, right. But just so we have words, because qualia is going to become very important as we get into your paper and all of that. Okay, so back to conscious agents. So what we decided to do was uh, we don't want to throw the kitchen sink in our mathematical definition. So we took what we felt was the bare minimum starting point. There are experiences, like the taste of chocolate, smell of garlic, and so forth. And those experiences affect the probabilities of other experiences occurring. So there are experiences and probabilistic relationships among experiences. That's it. So we're not bringing in the notion of a self, learning, memory, problem solving, intelligence, none of that. Other. What we're saying is, yeah, all that stuff is important, but we have to prove how it arises from just experiences and probabilistic relationships among experiences. Mm -hmm. So that's, as a scientist, you try, it's, a, it's what we call Occam's razor. You want to have the minimum number of assumptions at the start of your theory. Every theory has assumptions. There are the miracles of the theory. We want as few miracles as possible, right? So our only miracles are, there, well, it's a big miracle. There are experiences and probabilistic relationships among experiences. And we formalize that. Um, the experiences, um, we just write down what's called probability spaces. We can, if you want, we can talk about probability spaces. And the relationships among experiences are what we call um, Markovian kernels, and we, we get what's called Markov chain. So it's How very important. simple dynamics. So we'll we'll explain what Markovian dynamics are in a second. I don't, now that I finally have at least a tiny bit of a grasp, I don't know how important it is that people understand that. Sure. But I do want to know how important is it that uh, one bit of qualia impacts other qualia? Like does that, does that relationship play heavily into the idea of consciousness as a fundamental agent? Yes, we, we stipulate that as a fundamental property that, that experiences aren't in a vacuum, experiences probabilistically lead to other experiences. Okay, it's very interesting that you said uh, not in a vacuum because that my whole thesis is that the construct of space-time, the simulation, let's just be very clear, the simulation that is this real world Sorry, that's a terrible use of the word real. The simulation that everybody lives in and experiences is required. This is, this is my pitch. Uh, the simulation is a required constraint in order to give context yeah. that something can be like anything, but that for consciousness to explore the possibility space of qualia, you have to have a rule set Mm -hmm. And the rule set that yep. we're all in, which may be one of a gazillion headsets, but the rule set that we're all in creates the possibility for the subset of qualia that we as human beings or lizards or whatever experience. But without that rule set that is space-time, right, we right. would not have enough limitations right. to give us the context in order to feel a certain way. Exactly. That, that's, that's a very good way to put it. So that um, a lizard presumably sees things very, very differently than I do. Pigeons have four color receptors. We only have three. 
Pigeons have four? Yeah, that's right. So they see more color than we do. Birds. That's bullshit. I feel cheated now. Pigeons? <laughs> well, we, I knew 15% of women do. You, I did the, not know pigeons. Yeah, the mantis shrimp has more than 10. Photoreceptors? Yes. That's right. Different kinds of or, or or pigments that are that are used for for the photoreception process. So Crazy. so we're we're we may be cheated in in many many ways. That's for sure. So so yeah, we uh, and and we don't, for example, perceive um, polarization of light, and birds and maybe bees do as they they can perceive the polarization of light. Hmm. Um, we can't directly experience electric fields, and there are there are animals in the water that can do that. So some that see infrared, some that see ultraviolet that we can't. So, so we're, you know, we have a very, very small window and, and other animals are not restricted to the windows in which we, we see. So I like your idea that there, there's an, an infinite space of conscious experiences to explore. And when we look at different animals, we're seeing different explorations with different headsets and, and different, as you say, different constraints. And it's, it's um, in some sense, consciousness Exploring all of its possibilities, all the possible um, ways that uh, to, to explore. So, in in some sense, uh, we're here for the ride, and we should enjoy the ride. We're we're, we're you know we're exploring. Um, we, we thought this was the final reality. No, this is just one of countless possible headsets. Just one of countless, and um, we'll enjoy this ride, and then um, consciousness will then it's looking through other headsets. So I like your idea yeah, yeah, that, that it's, you know, there's some kind of consistency, some kind of coherence, but it's a subset of the experiences. There's an infinite number of experiences to explore. So um, this ride never ends. Hmm. Okay. So when I think about consciousness as fundamental, I cannot help but imagine a blob that then takes shape in the form of a human or a lizard or an avocado, whatever. Um, Help me understand what do you have an image in your head of what the what consciousness is? Is it just completely non-physical? Well, maybe the closest I can get that would be you know, the way that would communicate to people would be um, if you go into an entirely quiet room, shut off all the lights, close your eyes, and get very very still, mm. and don't think. Good luck. That's right. Usually letting go of thought is not easy. Um, but, but if you can go for a few seconds or a minute with absolutely no thought, and now you're just aware, you realize, yeah, I can be aware without being aware of anything in particular. I, I am fundamentally awareness. And into that awareness right now are coming a cup, a microphone, a table, I can close my eyes and those are, those are gone from awareness. So somehow there is this field of awareness that is, in some sense, deeply and fundamentally who you really are. That, so that... It th seems like your theory would say that's false. Well, it's going to say that the... Con so the, the reason why I talk about this awareness is that when we talk about all these specific conscious experiences... We have to write down something that's called a probability space first. We're, we're required mathematically to do that. So we write down a probability space in which Probability all, of qualia. That's right. Probability of qualia. So you have to write down the space of all the potential qualia that this particular conscious agent could experience. So here is this space, and it's, it, there's the mathematical structure. It's just sitting there prior to any particular experience happening. It's just sitting there. And it took me a few years to ask myself the question, what is that space? I had to write it down. I couldn't do the math. I couldn't write down my Markovian dynamics until I wrote down the probability spaces. But as a, you know, the way we do it is we just, of course, have to write that down so you don't even think about it. You write down the probability space and you, you go on to the fun stuff. You, you write down now the dynamics and so forth. Starts. But a few years later, I came back and go, well, wait a minute. I went too quickly on this first part. I had to write down a probability space what does that mean? Because this is a space prior to any specific conscious experiences happening. Mm. And so the best I can say right now is that perhaps is the mathematical counterpart to what I was just describing, which is the awareness that you can experience 
prior to having any particular specific conscious experience arise in that awareness. So that's, that's why I, I talk about it in, in that way. Um, Can I um, just restate that to make sure that sure. I understand and uh, linger on it for a second for the audience? So you're using words that I know you know are dangerous, that Annika Harris has warned you about letting people carry the sense of self into all this. Uh, right. Because you said you are the awareness, but really consciousness is the awareness that animates me in some way, or it needs my constraints in order for it to experience the qualia. I think that's the right way to think about it. And so in those moments where either through meditation, I get to true, where I am simply aware of the qualia of being aware, but when it's not aware of anything in particular, so I'm not aware that my foot hurts. I'm not aware that my um, my stomach is churning on food. I'm not aware of something I need to do later in that day. I am just, the, the potential to point that awareness at something is the thing that I'm sitting in, that that's who we really are. So that, that feels right, but I know it, it's re-trapping me in my sense of self that I am a real thing. Your right. whole thing clicks into place for me when I realize that according to your theory, and this makes a lot of things make sense in my own life, I am simply one instantiation right. Right. that creates a set of what I call biological limitations right. that then once I have those constraints, now the fundamental element of consciousness can begin to explore its qualia. The, the different things that like, oh, in this human form, I can experience these things. And with all the context that this person has, he responds to this thing in this way. Right. Um, Agreed. There are some deep complexities with that, but we'll push those off for later. Okay, so if, if that's where we're at, my fundamental question is, why does consciousness, why is it compelled to explore these qualia states? That's the $64,000 question. That's so... I don't know, but I, I can, I'm, of course, that's the very natural question to, to ask. And, and I agree with what you just said. I, said. I mean, I don't want to reify the self. What, what we are are avatars of the one, effectively. And the one consciousness is, the one awareness is exploring all of its possibilities through different avatars. Why? There, I, you know, I think there may be some deep mathematical reasons. So it may be that, I mean, there's, there are theorems to the effect that no system can completely know itself. It's impossible. So, because, for example, if I, if I have a computer and I want the computer to explore itself, how is it going to know itself? Well, it's going to have to build a model of itself and write down what it, well, in the very process of building a model of itself and writing into its memory things about itself, it's becoming more complicated. It's changing itself. So now, to really understand itself, it's going to have to now describe what it just did, and now to so you get this infinite loop. Um, and so there are there are problems with self understanding. It's not possible, in, in many cases, provably not possible, to have a complete understanding of yourself. You you get into this infinite loop of now I have to be more complicated to understand myself after I just understood myself, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so that's one direction of this. Another direction is um, there are there's a whole hierarchy of infinities. Um, so the the integers like so one two three up to infinity that's an infinite number of integers. We, we call that a countable infinity or aleph zero, um, the Hebrew letter aleph, and zero just meaning the smallest infinity. But there are other infinities. So the next, if you take um, the set of all subsets of integers, so like one, two, and one, five, and two, three, four, look at all the possible subsets of integers and ask, how many subsets are there? How many subsets of, of integers can you come up with? It turns out that, of course, there's an infinite number of, of these subsets. Because every number is divisible by an infinite number of subsets? No, we're just grouping them together. So I'm saying, l l l think about the group one and two. So that's a group. 
now one and five. Got it. So that's, we can group an infinite number, that's an infinite number of times. So those are called the, all the different possible subsets of the integers. Got it. And there's, of course, an infinite number of them because one is a group, two is a group, three. So we already know there's an infinite number, but there's more than that. How much more? It turns out it's a bigger infinity. So the- It's a bigger infinity. It's a, it's a bigger- Say infi- what? That, well, that's what mathematicians said when Cantor, the mathematician who first came up with this, um, when he first proved this. It feels a bit like my speaker goes to 11. Why not just take make 10 louder? But this one goes the, This one 11. goes, it's a, actually a different size of infinity. And How's so, that possible? I literally can't wrap my head around that. There is something um, called a, a Cantor's diagonal argument. So, it, so there's a simple diagonal argument where you can actually show on, pa- on paper, pen and paper, that um, it's impossible um, to capture all the power set this bigger infinity um, with the smaller infinity. So he gives what's called a Cantor's diagonal. So if people want to you know, check me on this, you just look up Cantor and Cantor's diagonal argument for a proof that there are these bigger infinities. Um, and you can actually, I think most people can actually follow the proof. I mean, it's, it's mind bending, but um, you can follow it. Well, there's not just one bigger infinity. That's ALF1 is the bigger infinity. Now take the power set. So th- by the way, taking the set of all subsets is called taking the power set. So the power set is all the possible subsets. So now I've got ALF1, which is the bigger infinity, which is the power, all the power sets of ALF0. But now I can take all the power set, the, the power set of ALF1. And that gives me ALF2. Take the power set again at ALF3, ALF4, and this goes forever. So there, so infinity is not one thing. There's an infinite, unending hierarchy of ever larger infinities. So we have to, in my, my view, take this into account in our theory of consciousness, that this, this, oh, all of these different infinities are valid directions for projection of this one deeper consciousness. And so we're going to, so the answer to your question may again be, because Cantor's hierarchy never ends, this exploration never ends. The exploration of the possibilities of consciousness of qualia is, in principle, never ending. So I get the never ending. But again, part. I, the, I I would just say um, I'm in deep water here, and I'm maybe over my head. Fair enough. Uh, this is the the fun part of exploring this is how what are the predictions that are made based on the hypothesis, right? So every hypothesis makes a prediction and then you you have something you can test and it becomes verifiable. So this is where it gets very interesting to me is what the predictions are that it makes. So going back to um, the hypothesis that I have that, okay, maybe this really is all a simulation because as we go to build the next simulation, it actually tells us more it, it gives me a better way to understand what's already happening. Now, again, I'm a lay person, so I may be way out of my own depth here, but I think people will be able to follow the internal logic. So this is what I was stating earlier about AI. So the way that AI works is there is an infinite possibility space in noise. So you can just think of it as a screen and that screen can have, think of every conceivable pixel that's there. And depending on what color you make any one of those pixels, if you have like a grand enough resolution, meaning enough pixels in a finite space that you can recreate any image that's ever been seen Mm -hmm. or created Mm -hmm. or even just what's possible. So if anybody's seen um, what they call an AI hallucination, where the AI will just continually like push into itself and every time it pushes in and a pattern begins to emerge, it then crystallizes that pattern and basically says the most likely shape to emerge out of this would be a staircase. But as you push in, the most likely shape to emerge out of that would be a cathedral. And and it just keeps going and going and going and going. And it never runs out of sort of most likely things to emerge out of this pattern is because it's looked at all of these things. And so it will create things that it's seen before. So the Mona Lisa would be one representation right. that is very predictable, especially given how many times the Mona Lisa has been replicated. So one of the things in the possibility space is the Mona Lisa, is a Rembrandt, is David, is you looking at your wife this morning is one of the possibility spaces that it could eventually draw out of this thing. So it's it's constantly searching for what is the next potential pattern. Now, my whole thing is, 
What really starts to make this interesting, and the reason that I think that the simulation isn't something to be brushed aside as being trivial, but is critically important, if you're right, that what the what consciousness is doing is it has some motivation for some reason that neither of us know why, but that it is cycling through all of its permutations, if that's what's really happening, then to do that, you need a set of rules. And so what I realize is I'm building the, going back to the Grand Theft Auto, so we're building a simulated world. And I realize as we build it, all I'm doing is making the most detailed if this, then that statements. And so I'm trying to create these algorithms that then not trick you, but they give you a set of rules by which you now must adhere. But by doing that, by actually limiting the possibility space, I can make a game that's quote unquote fun. So it is in the limitation, it's in the setting of rules that this becomes a useful space. So what I wanna know is, you, you talk a lot about like, hey, we wanna get out of the headset. Do you really? Do you wanna get out of the headset? Or do you want to manipulate the headset? Well, when I say we want to get out of the headset, that's as a scientist trying to look for a deeper theory. So as a scientist, I mean, we've, science is- But let me ask you. So the reason that Einstein, his breakthroughs were so useful is mm -hmm. within the headset, they let us do something. Are you trying to do something in the headset? Or so if you understand how the headset works, you can either manipulate the, like Einstein, bend space time, right? You can create GPS, which if you didn't understand relativity, you would not be able to do. Um, and that made the atom bomb possible. It made nuclear energy possible. It made GPS possible, his breakthroughs. Are you trying to do a breakthrough that has headset implications? Or are you searching a breakthrough that has get out of the headset implications? Both. So what I want to do is, is get a theory of what's beyond, at least a baby step beyond the headset. Presumably, as I mentioned, there's a Cantor's hierarchy of infinity, so we have infinite job security going beyond the headset. That's, it's literally an un, unending job. But to take a step entirely outside of the headset, then as, as you point out, as a scientist, I need to make predictions back in the headset because that's the only place we can do experiments. Is, to prove that you're to get, right, basically. Well, to, to, I don't, you can never prove that you're right, but, but to, to sort of what we'd say, scientists would say, to to get confirmation of your theories, which is not proof, but to to say um, you're not stupid, you, you, you seem it, to be on the good track. The things that we already understand, that's right, and hopefully makes novel predictions about things that we don't currently understand. That's right. We should be able to get quantum field theory back as a special case. We get Einstein's theory of general relativity as a special case. Uh, evolution by natural selection as a special case. We should, or generalizations of these theories within space time. So, so yes, we're we're going for the first baby step outside of space time in terms of a scientific theory. But of course, we have to project it back into space time where we can do experiments and a better look, um, like evolution by natural selection and quantum field theory, or understandable generalizations of those theories. Um, or we're wrong. Right, so so the, you might say, well, yeah, if you go outside of space time, you can do anything. You have all the fun you want. You can do anything you want to. Um, no, you can't. You can. You need to tie it back to what we can perceive inside our headset. Um, so that that's where we're headed. But um, as I said, there's infinite job security, and and so I view myself as as just looking for the, a first baby step mm. outside of the headset. Science for for centuries has only studied our headset because space time is our headset. But in the last 10 years, physics has gone beyond. We've talked before about the amplitudehedron and decorated permutations and other, other structures that physicists are finding. These are not the final word. Again, these are the first baby steps outside of our headset. And they will be, of course, refined and eventually superseded. Hmm. All right, so there's one of these things that I think I've, I've grasped enough that I can present it to people as one of the first baby steps. So in physics, one of the things they're constantly doing is smashing particles together to try to see what happens when those particles collide in the hopes that it will reveal smaller and smaller elements of the building blocks of the universe, uh, which will then help us understand what the, the sort of fundamental makeup of space-time is. 
And as they look at this data, what they found is uh, that there are patterns in that data that replicate endlessly. And you smash these together and the, the collisions, there's so much data. At first, it seems impossible. Just uh, so much data to wade through. We'll never understand anything. And then all of a sudden you realize, wait, there's only so many patterns once you take those, mm -hmm. like once you group those shatters, like if you think of it this way, if every time you broke a mirror, it broke into the same pattern, you'd be like, wait a second. And am I understanding it correctly that that's what happens when you collide particles? Statistically, yes, right. So it's not exactly, but 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 you you can use statistics to show that there are these statistical commonalities to the interactions. Absolutely. Okay, walk us through that, and why does that matter? Well, for physicists, of course, this is some of their most fundamental data. So, there, what are particles? Particles, Eugene Wigner taught us, are what he called you know irreducible representations, unitary representations of the group of symmetries of space-time, the, what they call the Poincaré group. It's essentially, particles are like the, the simplest things allowed by the symmetries of space-time, the simplest entities allowed. And so in some sense, by studying these particles, we're really studying the nature of space-time itself and the structure of space-time. Um, and so when they, for example, in the Large Hadron Collider, they will um, smash protons together, or they will, um, they'll also you know, sometimes have an electron and smash it into a proton and, at, at high energies. And when you do that at high enough energies, you destroy the proton. It actually falls apart. And you see all these particles scattering up, things like quarks and, and gluons and mesons and so forth. And so you can look at the angles that these particles are spraying out at and look at, for example, do they have uh, you know, a spin, a magnetic charge? What's their, do they have a mass? So you can, sort of, you can look at all these. And then when, when you start looking at all the data, you begin to see patterns in the data. And, and so we see, you know, for example, it was a big surprise to physicists that inside the proton, there were these things that they now call quarks. But the quarks, in some sense, at least at the energies that, that are available to us, can't be on their own. You can't have like quarks flying out on their own. There's something called quark confinement. And that was a big, big discovery. So quarks, like in, in a proton, there are three quarks, two up and one down. And a neutron has two down and one up. And, but if, if, you, if the quark escapes, if it, it's trying to get away, um, the force of attraction between two quarks grows with the distance. Hmm. And the energy, the, is, well, the, the, the force doesn't grow, the energy. So, so the force doesn't, normally we think of the force, the energy? force, yeah, so the force doesn't grow, the force remains constant. And so the energy, the, the potential energy, it keeps growing and growing as you, as you move these particles apart. And so, so at some point, they snap, and you you create all that energy goes and creates a new quark. Say, mm -hmm. so so then they pair off. So it's it's very very strange um, this, this quark confinement thing. So one reason we do experiments is because I mean who ordered that? We 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 wouldn't have like guessed, uh, uh, you know, quark confinement. And so but we we found quark confinement, and it's still being studied. I mean, trying to understand that there's a theory that if we get at really really high energies. Um, they won't be confined, but but those are energies that um, we currently are nowhere near, and we have no analytic proof right now of quark confinement for what what are called non-abelian gauge theories. So so one of the big open questions in physics is to actually prove this analytically. Um, that that so they they have lattice gauge models that that uh, of this that show it, and 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 they. They have other cases where they the experiments and the theory convince them it's the truth, but we don't actually have the final analytic proof of this in what's called non-abelian gauge um, theories. So, so that's still a, an interesting open question. But that's why physicists are, are doing this. These particles are really probing, in some sense, the fundamental nature of space-time itself. And so they look at, at, at patterns. They look at, at the... Um, the cross sections for interactions. So this was, for example, way back, um, 
in the early studying of, of the atom. Um, so there was a, a plum pudding model of the atom, right? So there was uh, um, electrons were these negative point particles inside a, um, a positive field. And then th this one experimenter <clears throat> started sh shooting particles at, at, at atoms. And <clears throat> the Plum model would say that most of these particles would just go, go straight through. <clears throat> and most of them did. <clears throat> but every once in a while, one would bounce back. <clears throat> a very, very small percentage of the time. And so that, that gave them the idea that, okay, there are point-like particles. We now call them protons and, and, and neutrons. Um, the, these particles that were that they were hitting, that, but they were a very, very small space within the, the atom. So the atom was mostly empty space. The electrons were <clears throat> way far away, so to speak, from the, the much smaller protons and neutrons. And so, but then we look inside the protons, and we find that the proton itself and the neutrons are composed of even smaller particles, quarks and gluons and, and, and so forth. And who knows, even the quarks and gluons um, might be you know, composed of smaller particles, but we don't have the resolution in our, our colliders right now to test that. We can only go to, you know, a thousandth or ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton, I think. And at, at that resolution, the quarks and gluons still look like point-like particles. What's up, guys? It's Tom Bilyeu, and if you're anything like me, you're always looking for ways to level up your mindset, your business, and your life in general. That's exactly why I started Impact Theory, a podcast that brings together the world's most successful and inspiring people to share their stories and most importantly, strategies for success. And now it's easier than ever to listen to Impact Theory on Amazon Music. Whether you're on the go or chilling at home, you can simply open up the Amazon Music app and search for Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu to start listening right away. If you really want to take things to the next level, just ask Alexa. Hey Alexa, play Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu on Amazon Music. Now playing Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu on Amazon Music. And boom, you're instantly plugged into the latest and greatest conversations on mindset, health, finances, and entrepreneurship. Get inspired, get motivated, and be legendary with Impact Theory on Amazon Music. Let's do this. It doesn't seem self-evident to me that just because Again, I'm, I'm granting you the conceit that consciousness is the, fu the fundamental thing, but it does not seem self-evident to me that even if consciousness is the fundamental thing that gives rise to this constricting rule set, as I describe it, mm -hmm. that we call space-time, um, that you couldn't have a theory of everything regarding space-time. Um, why do you think we have failed to get a theory of everything? In space-time. In space-time. Knowing that it's the simulation, but going back to Grand Theft Auto, it feels like even if I just said, oh, all I can tell you is cause and effect, that when this pixel goes here, it has this effect, and so now I can play everything's forwards or backwards. And you could in Grand Theft Auto. It has a set of rules, and it adheres to those rules. Right, right. Period, plain and simple. And so even though it is the, um, hmm. the, it is the headset, a computer program assuming that a simulation acts like a right. computer program, space-time in this case, uh, it, it it adheres to rules. And so when you get a quote-unquote sure. bug, it is what the program is programmed to do. You just didn't intend to program it that way. Well, I, I, in that framework, yes, I agree with you. that we, I think we could get a, a complete theory of space-time. Not a complete theory of everything, but a complete theory of space-time. Mm. So, <clears throat> so the theory of everything for me would be, you know, space-time is a trivial aspect of everything. Right. So, but, but absolutely, I think we can get a complete theory of space-time <clears throat> and we'll see its limits. It, it <clears throat> falls apart at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So we'll, we'll see that and we'll understand that. Yeah, so it's, it's quite, quite possible. I would say though, and, and I like your idea about the, <clears throat> the, the program and the rules and setting up a, a framework in which you can explore um, experiences. I'll throw in a little wrinkle. You're writing computer programs and... Um, <clears throat> So Alan Turing, you know, is sort of one of the fathers of modern computer science, and and Turing machine is, is like the first like really good theoretical framework for computer science, and the universal Turing machine that that Turing described in some of his papers um, is sort of our our notion of a universal computer. But the, but there's a, a well known limit 
to what Turing machines can do. Take, again, all the integers. You know, one, two, three, up to infinity, also minus one, minus two, and, and so forth. And ask, think about all the functions from the integers to the integers. For example, the square function. So, you know, the square of two is four, the square of four is 16, uh, and so forth. How many functions are there? It turns out it's a big, it's, it's a bigger infinity. It's, 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 a, a, it's not accountable, it's, not, it's a bigger infinity than the integers. But Turing proved that the set of computable functions is countable. So when you're programming, you're using only computable functions but they're a, they're a much smaller infinity than all the possible functions. So right now in our current technology, we're, when we build these computer simulations, we should know that we're using a probability zero subset of all the functions that are actually available. And maybe later on we'll figure out how to do something more interesting with all these other functions, but then as we go up again, Cantor's hierarchy, I think that, in other words, the, the kinds of rules, they're going to, are going to be very, very um, hard for our heads to understand. You can write down, if you take a class in, in theoretical computer science, you can study non-computable functions, so that you, and almost every function is non-computable, okay, as I, as I just said. The computable functions are probability zero. Mm. The set of all functions is, is all, most, most of those functions are not computable. But in a theoretical computer science class, you will, you will actually spend some time actually studying you know, how to, to construct and prove that a certain function is not, not computable. Like the halting problem is not, is not a computable. It, it's, it's not a computable function. It, it, it doesn't. And so... But it's really hard for us, even though almost every function is not computable, almost every function we can think of is computable. Mm. So here we are stuck with the limitations of our headset. And, and so thinking out of the box in this simulation idea is, is, is really going to be mind-numbing because to really think out of the box, you're going to have to learn how to think about non-computable functions. And that is not trivial. That's not... But that's... So I just wanted to throw that out there to just open up how complicated this, this can be and, and, and why the exploration because could to be. to get a theory of even just the everything of space-time, we have to get into non-computable functions? I don't know if we will or not. That, that, that's an open question, but, but we should be open to that possibility. Hmm. It's very and, interesting. And certainly to explore consciousness, I see no reason why we should a priori. I would say this, if someone claimed that the computable functions were all we need, I would say the burden of proof is on you. Mm. <laughs> mm. Talk about something I have not even considered. I don't know that I can wrap my head around that one yet. I have I'll a hard time. I mean, them. I took a class and I and I looked at that non-computable function, the halting problem, and you have to really, I mean, you have to be sober, <laughs> you have to be well-rested, and you have to think really hard. At least mm. with my apparatus, you have to think really, really hard to, to even grasp it. It's not yeah. trivial. Intense. Okay, so when we have a hypothesis that makes predictions, we need to be able to solve, we were talking about this a few minutes ago, we need to be able to solve problems or our hypothesis needs to predict outcomes of things that we can observe but not yet explain. Um, in I can't remember if you mentioned this in your paper, but I have heard you talk about this. So dark matter, dark energy, we don't know what the hell it is, but we know that the universe would not hold together if it wasn't for that, or it wouldn't be racing apart at the way that it's racing, whatever. It wouldn't function the way that it functions now. Um, what does your consciousness as fundamental agent tell us about dark energy? Well, nothing specifically, right? So that's, that, that's a big open um, question. In fact, one, one of the, um, my collaborators is a, is a student working right now on dark energy um, mm -hmm. experiments. Um, um, a, a brilliant student named Ben Nepper. Because he thinks it will yield results tied to consciousness as fundamental? Uh, no, I think it's just because it's a good thing to do at this stage in your career to mm -hmm. get that kind of experience and, you know, actually spend time hunting 
with real experiments for dark matter, so you learn the ropes. Um, I think it's, it was, very, and so he's doing that. Um, and who knows, you know, our, our current techniques may or may not find dark matter. We, we, we just don't know. Um, but it's no surprise from a point of view that says that space-time is not fundamental to say that there could be influences um, on our headset that are not explicitly represented by the headset itself. They're only seen um, as uh, influences on the headset. But, and so in, one way that we're going after this in our own mathematics is we have this uh, Markovian dynamics of these conscious agents. Can you take a second to explain to people what Markovian dynamics are? Yeah, Markovian dynamics is, is fairly simple in, in concept. It says that um, what you do next, so suppose I'm, um, suppose I'm a, on just, say, a sidewalk, and it has, there are different, I could either step one step to the right or one step to the left. And, and there's some probability. Maybe I, I choose to step to the right with probability of you know, two-thirds and to the left, probability of one third. And so you can see where, where would I go over time. But the key thing about it is that my, the step I'm going to take now only depends on where I am now. So where I'm going to end up next only depends on where I am now. Mm. So there's a finite memory. I don't have to know everything I've done in the past to know what's going to happen next. I only need to know where I am now. And that's the key Markov property, that you only need to really know the current state. You don't have to know the whole history to have all the prob all the information about the probabilities for what's going to happen next. The an analogy that I heard that I it was really helpful in understanding is if you think of it as airports, some airports have more connections to other cities than other airports. You're so if you're asking let's say that there's five airports in question, one is isolated and one is a hub to all the rest and then the other ones only have one or two links whatever. Um, going back to your idea of if I'm on the isolated uh, airport, there's only one option. So you don't need to know where I was before all of that. If you know I'm on the isolated one, you know I'm flying back to the only thing it's connected to, which is the other hub. Right. Now, when I'm at that hub that has, let's say, five options, right. now it's just a probability curve of which one I'm going to go to. But exactly once I right. go to another one of those airports... Then it's like, okay, well, I could go, you know, to um, Cincinnati, I could go to New York, I could go to LA, right. or I could go, um, let's say those are the only connections. But when I'm in Hawaii, if Hawaii forces me to route through LA, then you know where you're going to go. And I was like, okay, that, that at least gives a simple understanding of, oh, this is a relatively simple concept that sets aside all the history. And so from a computational standpoint, that becomes very important because when people talk about booting up a simulation of the universe, you very quickly to track every element that could possibly interact with every, if everything could interact with everything, it becomes impossible. And you would have to have a computer the size of the universe itself in order to track like a one for one atom basically. Um, but I think I'm understanding this right, that Markovian dynamics eliminates a lot of that computational need. Because I don't have right. to, there, there is a small set of things. And once I know the probability distribution, over time, it completely stabilizes. And so when I, I know if I'm at airport C, I know the exact probability of where they're going to go next. That, that's right. So uh, the Markovian dynamics is, uh, help simplify things um, by demanding only a finite memory instead of an infinite memory of, of the past history mm. of what, what you've been doing. Um, but you can make the memory as big as you want. So it's really not too much of a limitation either. With nice, so it's a nice formalism. So why do we care about it? Um, well, most of us don't have to deal with infinity anyway in terms of past history. So we can only we can just use finite histories, and, and, that's, and that's quite good. And it, another reason um, to be interested in Markov dynamics is we talked about computable functions. Well, Markovian kernels um, are computationally universal. So anything that can be computed with a neural net or with a Turing, universal Turing machine can be computed with Markovian kernels. So they, they form a, they give us a nice network kind of modeling for dynamics, but they also give us universal computational abilities. And they're not limited to computable functions because the 
sets on which the probabilities are defined need not be computable sets. So they actually give us a window toward going beyond computation. I'm not there right now, but, but that window is there in the future if we need to go there. Um, I'd, I'd lo hopefully that will go there. But, but so our, our, our current model is a Markovian model of conscious agents. And then what we have to do is, is we can then show that space-time is just a projection of this dynamics. And so you only, th there's a lot That's of states. Really fast before you move on. So just re-anchoring people that these um, conscious agents, the states that they can be in are coffee, elation, right. desire, headache, so when we're talking Markovian dynamics, we're talking about moving from one of those qualia states to another, a human headache versus a dolphin headache, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So uh, help me understand why that's important that I can, like if I'm in the state of blissed out coffee taste, uh, that I have a certain probability of going somewhere else. That, that feels counterintuitive. It feels like my wants and desires are really what's going to drive the next state, not the state that I'm currently in. Th that's right. So, so now we're just talking about the consciousness, not about space time, for for this question. Yes. Right. right. So there, um, when we write down a Markovian kernel, and say, okay, whatever your conscious experiences are now, uh -huh. this Markovian dis kernel describes what your next conscious experiences will be probabilistically, and also um, what, how you're influencing the conscious experience of others. So, so now we can ask the kind of question you're asking. So is that's happening outside the headset? This, this is all outside the headset, right. This is all, this is. So the probability of what I do next is determined outside the headset that, that, by Markovian dynamics. That's why we're gonna get to this dark energy and dark matter stuff. You are breaking my brain right now. That's, so, that's, so that's why I brought this up is because your question was about dark energy and dark matter. So what we have to, to, to get at that from this point of view, what we're gonna say is look, most of the states of this dynamics are states that are not represented in space time. They're dark. So there are these influences that you're not gonna see. When you count up all the matter and all the energy that you can see inside space-time, you're gonna be missing all the stuff that, that didn't project into space-time. So uh, in fact, probably the dark energy and dark matter is much more than we've discovered so far. Uh, so, so that's why it's important, but. <laughs> so, okay, hold on. This all really does start to feel weird when I remind myself that this is about qualia Right. the sense of it being like something. And so I'm going to make something up. Uh, dark energy is the energy created. This is why I don't understand how it could be energy, but uh, dark energy is the energy of a qualia that I will never be able to experience. So it's something like an alien drinking blood wine, uh, making that up but it has to be qualia, so it's gotta be something to be like that thing. Is that right? Well, it, it's, it's even more complicated than that. It, it's not just one qualia, it's probably who knows how many countless infinities but of qualia. But it would be things like that, that, right? that, that, Exactly right, that are interacting and affecting the dynamics that we perceive inside of our space-time headset. But notice that among the qualia are, for example, the qualia that you are about four feet from me. Uh-huh. So your position, so, Position, there's a quality. I mean, it's very, very different to experience you four feet from me than four inches from me. Max. Those are very, very, so, so depth and space is quality. And in fact, um, our quality there it sort of compresses. If I look at the, like a distant mountain and the moon rising over that mountain, the moon looks a little further than the mountain, but not much, right? Yeah, yeah the moon's a little further. But if you were to, you know, that mountain might be, you know, 20 miles from me. The moon is a quarter million miles from right. me. So that means you have no idea that it's like orders of magnitude further away. You, so, so our qualia space of depth is quite compressed compared to what we would, might call the measured world. So like when you actually, and, and you see that in, in, in your, you know, like a Grand Theft Auto, when you're actually looking around, you only see the roads around you in a little bit. But the Grand Theft Auto world, you might be able to drive thousands of miles 
in, in a really complicated simulation, you don't see thousands of miles at any one time. You only see a little bit that your headset allows you to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, but because you use that same headset and you're, uh, you're not stuck in that world, it, you're at, there's actually a supercomputer that has a much bigger world than your headset, right? Than what you see right now in your headset. But it's rendering a little bit in your headset right now. So that's why the, the, the mountain and the moon look about the same because they're, they're headset. We can now, of course, when we go to the moon th- on a rocket, now it's like going through Grand Theft Auto with your headset on and going places that you couldn't see because they were too far away in your current headset view, but you can get there eventually. And, and so that also is pointing to a world outside of your headset. Your headset is just what the little bit of that world that you're rendering at, at any one time. Now, dark Are energy and dark you getting, matter. You're not really getting outside of your headset to go to Mars. You're getting outside of what you rendered previously. Well, so at, at any moment, you're only seeing in your headset, mm-hmm. right? But if I go to Mars, I'm still seeing in my headset. Yeah, and in Grand Theft Auto, for example, there might be a, a, you know, a Porsche that's you know, a thousand miles away. And you're going to have to drive like three hours in the game to get there. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to see it. So it's in, the, it's in the simulation outside of your headset right now. To get it in your headset, you're going to have to do all this work to get it inside your headset. But it, it already existed in the software and the computer prior to that. Mm-hmm. You just don't see it in your, in your headset. Understood. So, so, that, so all the stuff inside space-time, the galaxies that we see that are far away from us and so forth, that's not dark matter and dark energy. That's, that's more like the headset stuff that you see in Grand Theft Auto if you go far enough within the game. But then there's this deeper notion that there are some states in the computer that you'll never see in, in Grand Theft Auto, but they could uh, you know, subtly influence what you are seeing in Grand Theft Auto. Doesn't your thesis necessarily, no, you're not gonna say yes to this, but I'm gonna finish. Doesn't your thesis necessarily mean that that is some element of uh, the, I like to think of it as a blob, that is consciousness cycling through um, why would it be in the same simulation? Cycling through different qualia, uh, but then I don't understand why it would be in the same simulation if it's going to be something I could never possibly interact with. Right. I mean, almost everything that the real consciousness is doing is not in our in our headset. We have this. What we're perceiving is probability zero of what's going on. Mm-hmm. It's, it's basically, if you ask, of all the things that are being experienced in consciousness, what percent of it do, do we experience? Zero percent. Zero percent. Yes, understood. <laughs> but I, I am in a way experiencing dark energy because it is the thing that makes the universe the way that it is now. So I'm just trying to understand. So the thing that, I, right. that I'm sort of debating in my own head is, okay, when I grant you that consciousness is fundamental, then there's all this internal logic to um, the space-time continuum that I know and love. Right. But I don't know that it's the only way for me to apply the sort of same rationale that you use of whether it's Markovian dynamics, Girdle's incompleteness theorem is probably the more important because that's the one that really helps me understand AI and Mm -hmm. what AI is doing. Um, So I'm wondering, okay, if I for a second say you, you have touched on something that's really important, which is that space time is the simulation, but I don't need to draw the conclusion that consciousness is the fundamental thing. Agreed. That just becomes a debate about whether consciousness can emerge or sure. not. Um, it could be that there, and this feels more right to me when I try to imagine it, but I fully admit what I'm about to say simply pushes God farther down. It, it kicks the can. Okay. So what feels intuitive to me, because it's what I'm doing, mm-hmm. is that I exist in somebody else's simulation that exists in the real world. And that person, they still need God or something. I have not in any way, shape or form explained that I've kicked the can. But then all the sort of, there's a set of rules. They seem like they're a little too perfect. They're a little too finely tuned. You've got the Fermi paradox, which I'll probably ask you about later. Like all these things are like, nah, this is a little sus. The way that this whole space time is trying to hang together just doesn't really quite complete the circle, including the 
so much of the energy that makes the universe work is this dark stuff. Duh, don't worry about that. Feels like a 13-year-old programmer hand-waving it away, telling the teacher like, ah, I just needed something in order to you know, make all of this work. And when I do that, everything also falls into place. Where I'm like, oh, wow. Okay, so I get how they're rendering all this in real time using the same principles that I'm now seeing AI use, pulling things out of the possibility space, because as somebody developing a video game, I will just tell you the hardest thing is creating the art assets. So they need something that can render this stuff on the fly and, and creating the art assets that look good, but are also optimized for the rendering engine because the rendering engine just gobbles resources. Right. So it's like when I take that view and instead of going, there's this magical thing called consciousness, I'm like, oh, I'm still dealing with God. There's a God somewhere doing something, whatever. There's a thing I don't understand, but space-time being born of a 13-year-old just trying to, like you could literally go to the Unreal Engine store and be like, give me Einstein's physics. Right. And you plunk them in and it would work. He wouldn't even have to know how to program it. Right. He just took it, well, you know, whatever, give me what they understood in 2023 and I'll just drop it in, right, you know, we'll see what happens. Like that still works. Exactly. So I agree. what is it that gives you the confidence that, the thing that is giving birth to all of this is consciousness itself. Oh, I'm not confident at all. So I, everything is it is, your leading theory? It's just my leading theory. Why is it your leading theory? Um, first, I would agree with you that we could just say that there are some kind of dynamical entities outside of space-time and, and be agnostic about the nature of those entities, just write down their dynamics and then show how it projects into space-time and we could be good, absolutely. The reason I'm going after consciousness is um, two things. Very personal first, I mean, we all have headaches and we have conscious experiences. Um, and so we want to understand what consciousness is, right? And, and the standard view right now among my colleagues in the neurosciences is that consciousness is um, something that's created by brain activity or embodied brains, or perhaps if we're lucky, AIs and so forth. But, so, but physics is fundamental, physical stuff is fundamental, and consciousness is a latecomer. If space-time is doomed, if space-time is not fundamental, that whole story of consciousness is out the window. Is it, is, does physicality go out the window? Let me see if I can answer my own question sure. using your words to see if I understand this. Is physicality out the window if space-time is doomed? You would say yes, because local realism is proven that it isn't. There is no local realism, that all of this is fake. Everything you see and experience, it's all just quote unquote rendered in real time. Right as you engage with it. Therefore, at least in what we experience, because local realism isn't true, physicality cannot be true. That's, that's right, to put it very simply, I don't have neurons right now. If you looked inside my skull, you would see neurons, you would render them, yeah, but there are no neurons. Right, so neurons do not exist when they're not perceived. So neurons couldn't create consciousness because they're not even there to do it. Mm -hmm. And nor could particles. You know, particles don't exist when they're not perceived. Here's where limited minds like mine get tripped up. Because your analogy is so profound and feels so right, and for this to be a simulation, I say to myself, something has to be running the simulation. And I can't get myself outside of that something somewhere is going to be physical. That's a hard one. For me, too. By the way, I have all the same knee-jerk emotional reactions that everybody else has to this stuff, even stronger. Um, so maybe that's why it's good for someone like me to be doing this because, you know, I don't, my emotions don't believe any of this. Mm. They don't believe it at all. It's literally only the mathematics pushing me, kicking and screaming at each step to, so I, you have to go with the mathematics and what, what the theories are saying, but I don't find it that intuitive. Maybe I will at some point, um, but I don't find it that intuitive. So, so yeah, you, you could say, you know, we don't need to talk about consciousness. There's just some dynamical entities outside of space-time. Why can't but, consciousness be a part of the simulation? It may, you know, for all I know, it, it, it may be. I mean, so maybe this thing that I called awareness, where this prior to any particular conscious experiences, now, now there I'm completely in over my head. I have no idea what to say about that thing, right? I, I literally have nothing intelligent to say. What if awareness is just the qualia of being rendered, of your process being run by the central computer? 
that's as good an idea as I've ever had, but, but, I, but I don't feel very confident in this area at all. I mean, mm. the closest we can personally get is the kind of thing I suggested, you know, go into a quiet room, turn off the light, let go of thought, which is not easy, let go of everything, and try to just be aware of awareness. Be aware of being aware. And, and try to sit there with that. And what you find is it's a, it's a profound experience. It, the, the more you just sit there being aware of awareness without, without thinking about, you know, you're not, see, the whole point about not thinking is thinking you're back into this small computational realm. You're back into this really tiny, out of all the infinities, you're, you're back in this little tiny infinity. So letting go, so this is not, it's well, not, we know the headset is computation, though, right? Uh, well, we don't know for sure. Our, our current models are, but but we Doesn't haven't proven local that. Local realism not being real mean that it has to be computational? No, it doesn't entail. I mean, so it doesn't entail that at all. No. Huh. Now I'm broken again. <laughs> I don't right, know right. how to make sense of that. Right. So so um, how can anything? How uh, this is interesting. Here's my base where I realize I don't know how to escape this. Uh, I feel like for qualia to exist, it must be processed. I will even grant that the processing is simply the Markovian dynamics of Markovian dynamics of moving from one thing to another. The switching of states, fine, but it it is moving from one state to another, which I will right. call that processing. Right. Yeah, it's just not a physical process. It's it's it's. You know, and it doesn't have to be a computational process. Even it could be functions that are not computational. Yeah, I still. So it's, it's I try not to all, kill the audience with the things that I just can't wrap my head. Well, it hurts about. me too. I mean, I'm telling you these things, but not because it's easy for me. It, it, my my head hurts too thinking about these. Do you things. have an example of something that that's non computational? I think you gave one earlier, but I forget. Well, so um, the the standard story that you if you take a computer science class and study the theory of computation. They'll t tell you about something called the halting problems. So this is the, like one of the big problems that, it, it, and Turing, I believe, posed it and 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 showed that it was not computational. The question is this: If you, you a Turing machine is like, like a a universal Turing machine is is like a universal computer. You can give it a program. Turing thought about putting a tape with with some punches on it, essentially. Mm -hmm. So you have this tape reader, and the Turing machine would look at one square in the tape and read that symbol, and then it would change state and then move left or right and write a symbol. And that's, that's all the universal Turing machine could do. And, and so the question that Turing asked was, um, suppose we asked the question, um, will the Turing machine stop after a finite number of moves? Will it halt um, on arbitrary sets of, of these tapes that you're giving it, you know, programs. That's called the halting problem. Will The question is, is there a Turing machine that can decide, so is there an algorithm that can decide whether this Turing machine will halt or not for any particular given input? So can you tell the Turing machine to stop? Is that the... Well, well no. So, so I should say one more thing about Turing machines. So a, a Turing machine is going back and forth and changing its state. And when it's done, when it actually is like computed the square of a number or whatever it is that it's doing, it, it halts. It goes into what's called a halt state. And so that when it goes into a halt state, that means it's done. It, it, it did the computation. So, but, but there are some computations that go on arbitrarily long. Like, well, I don't understand why. You, they, you never come to the end. You, you never come to the end of it. There's some sort of recursive loop in it. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's by right. Its nature. In Got fact, it. probably most. <clears throat> so the question is. So um, when you say non-computational, you mean something that ends up in that loop? Well, yeah, where you, where the Turing machine never halts. You give it an input. It never thinks it's done. And it never thinks it's done. Got that's, it. That's so the halting and problem. Most is, things are like that. Yeah, I, I would guess um, that. Yeah, most tapes are are probably. You wouldn't halt. It would be my guess, but but that's that's not an important point here. I think that's the case, but it's not a central point. The the fact is that many won't halt, and so the so the question that Turing raised was something like this: So is there a Turing machine that can tell you if it says give me given this Turing machine and all these inputs whether this Turing machine which on which one of these inputs will it halt? Okay. And it turns out that, that there's no Turing machine that can do that. 
So it's not a computable there's no function. There's no Turing machine that will know which one is going to halt? That there's no Turing machine that can tell you that whether this other Turing machine will halt or not on all these inputs. Interesting. So it can never understand it without running the calculation itself? Well, and, and the Turing machine itself would never halt. The one that was trying to do this would never halt. Mm. So it's called the halting problem, and, and, and it's... it's so when you take a computer science class, you'll get a much better explanation than I've just given you. But basically, it's, it, it, you'll see that um, there's no algorithm that will tell you whether a, comp a particular Turing machine will halt or not on any particular, any possible inputs. Hmm. Is, so when somebody says it's Turing complete, does it mean that it halts appropriately? Or is that something else entirely? That's something else entirely. Got it. Okay, that's, uh, that's crazy. Um, Persistence. Yes. So this is, I think, a, I think a key part of my thesis, mm -hmm. which is persistence is the hard problem for AI right now. And when I look at the thing that holds AI back from being something that people can implement into their workflows today, it's because it can give you really amazing stuff, but it cannot give you really amazing stuff over and over from different angles and different setups, people are working on it. And you know, by the time this comes out, I'm sure it'll be even better. And a year from now, it'll, it'll be a solved problem. But that feels like part of the rule set that you need inside of the headset is to create this sense of persistence. Um, so I wonder if Again, going back to the idea of the headset becomes necessary because you have to create persistence in order for the qualia to be explored. Mm -hmm. You have to have that. Do you agree with that sense of persistence being a necessary tool of consciousness to explore qualia? Um, well, first, I'll just say, I think a concrete example of the persistence is like, I look up at the moon and then I look away and I say, is the moon still there? And you look up and you say, oh yeah, the moon is still there. And then, mm -hmm. then, then you look away and I look and then, so every time I look back, I still see the moon where I expect to see it. That's, that's what we mean by persistence here. And I don't think that we need to have that kind of persistence to have a headset. I, I think we do, we, we have that. But for example, um, there's E. e coli bacteria. Mm -hmm. The way I understand, I, what I've read is that it swims along and um, it, there's some amino acid or something that, it, that it's eating. And as long as there's a good gradient of that thing, it, it keeps going in the direction it's going and eating the stuff. But it all, if things start going south and it's not getting the amino acid or whatever it is it's eating, um, it, it's, it's this flagellum it, it, that it's using to, to move forward, it, it, it turns it in the other direction, it, which makes it, it's like a random turn. Mm -hmm. So it just rotates the other way, and that gives it like a random new... So it's like a random orientation generator. It orients is a, a completely new generation, a uh, new direction, and then it starts going. And if it's good, then it goes. And, and So that's its search mechanism. It's a very stupid, but it works for the E. coli. Now, does it have... Would, does E. coli necessarily have persistence? Yes. I don't know. You, you, yeah, 100%. Okay. It must. Okay. So um, right before we started rolling, I had the very good fortune of introducing you to another one of my favorite people, right. Eric Weinstein. And um, one of the things that he said to you was that um, you said, I don't have neurons. And he was like, what? <laughs> uh, and he had earlier made a statement that you couldn't because you had never met him before, there's no way for you to render him upon entrance because he remained consistent to himself, to me, and that's what I mean by persistence. So if I look at E. coli, let's say I'm the first person to discover it, it will look a certain way. If somebody else without knowing I discovered it also discovers it, it will look the same way. If a person... Well, well, I agree with you on that. My, my question was different. From E. coli's perspective, I was thinking through the headset of E. coli. What, so E. coli has its own headset. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, for E. coli, see, it may not need to have this persistence notion because all it needs to know, I'm happy, I'm eating. Wow. So this so, shows just, the importance of uh, defining terms. Right. So what I mean by persistence is that 
you will look the same. So when you look up at the moon and then look away and it gets trash binned in your headset, and then you ask me, is it still there? And I look up and I'm like, yeah, it's still there. Every time I look at the moon, it's gonna be the same. Every time you look at the moon, it's gonna be the same. And if somebody were to take a photo of that, we would both recognize that photo as being accurate. No, I, I completely now, agree with all that. If I'm building out a simulation, I don't go, uh, here is marker for moon, represent it differently to you, but consistently, represent it differently for me, but consistently, I go, make the moon persistent. The moon will always look like this, and that way, no matter who discovers it, they would describe it the same, they would see it the same, like, rather than me have to be like, oh, you're calling it red, and I have to remember that red is different for this guy. And so it's like, how do you know that red is the same? If this is all simulation, it's obviously the same, because otherwise you would have to like program the shit like a thousand different ways. Now, you may experience uh, a, like additional layer of sentiment about a thing that makes the quality a different, and this sort of gets into your hierarchies of infinity, that fine. But going back to neurons, if I smash somebody's head a million years ago, maybe that's too far because the brain's changed, 100,000 years ago, neurons would look the same even though I don't know what they are. I'm just like, meh, that's, when you smash a head, this is what you see. If I smash that same head today, I'm gonna see the same thing. Right. Because even if this is all a simulation, there is a level of persistence. And I completely agree with you on that. I was just raising the question, could we come up with a game that was so simple, that was so trivial, that in some sense persistence was irrelevant? I mean, you either are told bad or good. That's all you're told, bad or good, and you do something random. That's, that's what I'm saying, the E. coli. Yeah, you're talking now about behavior, okay, which, right. so if if we're in agreement on persistence, that, yeah, I agree on the persistence that still. the, um, just to say it another way, the simulation is a set of rules, descriptions, assets, right. like art assets for just an easy way to explain it. And so there's gonna be uniformity across everything that uses the headset, they're all gonna be the same, I so I don't have to like create all these individual things. I agree, yeah. Then you have a very separate notion, which is the behaviors. And we were talking about this earlier. This still really, um, I don't know how to understand it. In your paper, and this is probably a good time to now get into the paper. Okay. So the paper felt like as a lay person who's interacted with you in an interview format, but never having, um, I had your book, but again, that was more inviting people into uh, popular science, whereas the paper was like deep mathematics. Mm -hmm. Uh, felt like a step forward yes. in your guys' certainty of at least how to explain what you think. Right. Um, but one of the ideas in the paper is this action potential. I don't, I can't remember if that's how you described it. But um, so I want to go back to this idea of the, and this is where I sort of um, started thinking this makes more sense to me as a 13 year old programming set of rules than it does uh, consciousness giving birth to a set of limitations in order to experience qualia, because okay. then every computation has to be about qualia, which I may have said earlier, but I wanna, I wanna say something that I think you actually state in the paper. Okay. If this really is consciousness is the fundamental layer, and all consciousness is trying to do is run the Gödel's incompleteness theorem against all of the qualia that it could experience, and that the headset and our biological experience, which is really just the thing inside the headset, are simply constraints for it to express qualia. All math is. All math is, is the representation of the different elements of qualia. So whether that's probability of given behavior, um, likelihood of moving from one thing to another, one state to another, that's all math is here to compute. And in the paper you touch on, I'm calling action potential, but that could be my poor memory. Yeah. Um, I feel like I have free will. I think it's an illusion, but I mm -hmm. feel like I have free will. But all of this qualia, if it is true that that's what's really happening and this is just consciousness running through all the different qualia, it doesn't feel like that to me. So there's some element of uh, the simulation that makes it feel like I'm living a life and right. that the quality is born out of me living a life, not born out of, I don't live a life so that I can experience qualia. But your hypothesis, I think mandates that my life 
is the consequence of cycling through qualia and not the other way around. And it's the Markovian dynamics of the likelihood of me going from this state to that state that dictates, that that forces my life. Is that accurate? Well, not quite. So it's it's there's this complicated dynamics of consciousness going on. And, and the coin of the realm of our experiences and and that's that's the hypothesis. So that's experiences are 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 being um, shared and triggered. So think like the Twitterverse, right? You know, but what what you're tweeting are experiences, and what you're receiving are experiences. So the consciousness must break into a just metric shit ton of separate entities for this to work. That, that's right. So, so and so we we're gonna have this. It's like um, the Twitterverse is, is huge, millions of users and so forth. If you look at my Twitter page. Right, there's only a small number of people following me, and a small number that I'm following. So I'm getting a tiny picture of Twitter. I'm pro so the, there, there's a big social network, a lot going on. If you look at the projection onto Hoffman's little thing, it's just a small little. And, and if you, if that's all you saw, you wouldn't get a feel for what's everything that's going on in Twitterverse because I have very specific interests. I mean, you, you'd think that everybody likes consciousness and mathematics and is a, is a geek, and and they're not. So so you'd get the wrong picture about what what really is is the Twitterverse. And so I would think that all the headsets are just projections, like taking the Twitterverse onto one person's Twitter account. There are projections onto, uh, you know, a consistent, as you point out, the, the, to keep persistence, you might want to have a whole group of them that, that see the same thing and, and can both agree that, you know, all agree that there's a red Porsche or something like that in the game. So, so you could have a, a bunch of them that have similar projections of, of, of the one, bigger conscious dynamics. Um, or maybe I should just stop there and see if that's addressed to your question or... It has not yet. So okay, what I'm so... trying to figure out is about action. So I feel like I'm living my oh, life. Oh, am I actually making a choice? Yeah, like what, what do you think... Does my life arise out of um, me taking action and having wants and desires? In fact, that's probably the base way. I would predict based on how it feels, that the 13-year-old, because I, I probably make that, my things fit better for me if I just assume that you've got a 13-year-old who pulled um, Einsteinian physics off the shelf to put into the program and, and they're just running it based on a set of rules, but it doesn't really matter. But we get to, here's, here's how it feels, that I was given a set of wants and desires and here's where evolution comes in. So I want to survive long enough to have kids that have kids. And then everything in my life is just an echo of that. It's like a hilariously limited amount of rules that you have to give to me, uh, sort of based around um, how I stay alive, the desire to stay alive, um, what I want to quench hunger, thirst, sexual desire, so on and so forth. Uh, and then you just let me go. And when you when you think of like a human as, as a character in a video game, it has certain stats. So you marry right. those wants and desires right. with those stats, and then you just let them go and you see who they bump into and, oh, you had childhood trauma. And so that's gonna, well, that's gonna change your stats. But it's like, you just watch how all that plays out. And so you get, and I think this is why people are really gonna struggle with this, isn't an emergent phenomenon. Because all, like when I think about building the game, I am just, beating it into the head of the team, we want the community to create emergent phenomena that rises out of the nature right. of the rule set and the technologies. Right. right. So I'm not trying to create the emergent phenomena and then hope that the technology is born of that, which is basically what you're pitching, I think. And so I can get behind it when I think, oh, this is just... Uh, Girdle's incompleteness theorem. So there's an infinite number of things to cycle through. And as long as I grant you that consciousness, for whatever reason, has a desire to cycle through all of that, then everything does make sense. It plugs in and it works. But then I'm like, wait, the only part of that that then I don't know how to conceptualize, because it could just be that I'm trapped in my headset and I just, I'm not thinking about it right. But what I don't know how to conceptualize is that I am living a life and so to your point that whatever exists outside of the headset has got to explain what's in the headset. And I am living my life. 
Mm -hmm. I'm not just cycling from random qualia to qualia to qualia. The qualia that I experience mm -hmm. seem mapped so perfectly to the actions that I take, which are clearly influenced by how I feel. That I get. Right. But it manifests as I'm feeling tired. Therefore, I go to bed. Right. Therefore, I have the experience of the softness of the sheets uh, versus the consciousness saying to itself, I would like to cycle through the softness of sheets now. So either this is the consciousness has like an agenda and it knows how to create the simulation in a way that's going to yield the best outcome. And so it like sat there like, oh, what would be the best way? <laughs> like how it creates humans in the way that it creates humans. It creates life in the way that it creates life. It creates day night cycle, which already creates like so many limitations on us and shapes our fundamental evolution and all of that. I'm just like, do you really believe that's consciousness that set all that in motion? Or is that emergent phenomena out of a simpler thing that consciousness like if consciousness just gave birth to the laws of physics then i'd be like word this all makes sense consciousness just becomes god fair enough um but if consciousness in your explanation is anything other than god i think i'm confused so great great question on, on the free will and then the nature of the origin of this headset and, and is it just all pre-programmed or is there room for exploration the uh, that's not quite what i'm saying what I'm saying is I know it's pre-programmed because the headset, which you have agreed with, has a set of rules. Right. Well, yeah, that it does have a, well, a set of probabilistic rules. Yes, but to get there, you need rules. You Absolutely. need rules of right. probability. You need at a minimum math. Absolutely. Right? So Absolutely. something somewhere, either math is fundamental or consciousness created math as a way to create a set of rules in order to experience qualia, which... That is hard to wrap your head around, but right. So that, is so, that assumption correct? That assertion, I think, is a better way. Is that assertion correct? I'm not sure. This is these are deep waters now, so that's why I, I'm myself now having some difficult trouble. So I would say the the free will question first. I when I look at our mathematics, I could interpret the Markovian kernel for a given agent as representing the free will choice of that agent I could I could interpret it that way and it, but if I do that I look at all the others and it's being affected by all the other conscious agents and I, I, you can so my probability space is being impacted by the other conscious agents th th that's right but but you could say this just my, just my quality are being comp but my free will is not but but here's the the trick is that groups of conscious agents that satisfy certain conditions, are also a conscious agent. So that means if I think about all the individual con smaller agents as having free will, and then this new agent also has, if I think about having free will, I would need to have a, a new notion of free will that, that's really quite an interesting one. It, it's going to be um, a scale, in some sense, a scale-free notion of free will that can go for, uh, for What is a scale-free notion? That it'd be true at all scales, no matter how many conscious agents I put together to make a big conscious mm -hmm. agent, I would still be able to talk about this agent has free will, but all of the constituents also have their own free will. My guess is that that might be able to be made to work. So that the question is, you know, if I say, is it only the one big consciousness that has free will and we're all puppets, or do all the little consciousnesses have free will? The, the answer might be both. But but you're gonna have to but there'd be this new mathematics that that shows in some sense that the free will of the one is made of all the genuine free will choices of the individuals, and and so it's not like a, a, a autocratic god saying you must do this. It's 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 rather a god exploring all of its own possibilities, so to speak, um, freely um, through all of the components that which are also freely act, interacting but their free interactions are all part of the one freedom of, of of the one in other words i think that there could be a mathematically consistent notion of free will that doesn't say either or but both and so we get this scale free notion i haven't written it down yet but that's why i'm 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 saying that these are deep waters and and this is where 
we're going to have to, to answer your question, we're going to have to go after some deep mathematical theories of what we mean by, by free will. My guess is that it's possible, but, but we'll have to see, that we could have genuine free will at the smaller agent level, um, and that's not incompatible with free will um, at higher levels and even the free will of, of whatever the super, I mean, I can't even describe the, the one agent. It, it transcends any mathematical description. Um, so we could, we could never actually get this mathematical model in the final limit that I'm describing, but could we get it in, in smaller infinities that we can deal with and, and show that it works there? We can't get to Aleph infinity, but we can go maybe in smaller infinities and see if it works there and get some hint. Ultimately, I mean, the reason why I said I'm in deep waters is because I'm, I know that ultimately I can't answer you. Ultimately, I can't get to a final description of the one agent. I mean, it literally, our mathematics says it transcends any description. So I have to halt and say, I can't tell you. I can only tell you about projections of that one. And the, from the projections, the mathematics points to the one, but I, our analytical tools fail us. We, we can't actually go there. Can but, you walk me through how the um, data, how the projections point to the one? And the one being like a, the one God, consciousness, it's like a thing. Yes? Well, again, I, that's a good question because, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that the data we have uniquely determine this theory, right? A absolutely not. So I, I would say they point me as a, as a scientific theorist toward this, this hypothesis. Here I am with conscious experiences, interacting with others that I think have conscious experiences. My physicalist framework can't explain them at all. And so I'm proposing that there are these conscious experiences that give rise to space-time as a interface. And when I write down the most simple mathematical model that I can do for that, all of a sudden that mathematics, I wasn't intending it, but the mathematics points to a, a single um, major consciousness that I can never describe. So, so that's the sense in which I say it, it was sort of pointed, pointed to that. And I would guess that other conscious agents with either interfaces that are not even like our space-time interface, but but have mathematical skills, um, and are looking, coming up against the limits of their own interface and starting to realize, oh, I thought this was real, but this is just the interface, might, under the hypothesis that consciousness is fundamental, might run into the same thing and then get pointed by their own mathematics to to a universal consciousness. Um, like, but, but again, this is, these are deep waters and I'm, I'm not secure here at, at all. Um, but I would say that the free will, I mean, I've, I've have good discussions like with Annika Harris and so forth about, about free will and I, I, free will is it standardly understood, uh, probably not, but free will in this new sense in which I'm saying that there could be a scale free notion and a, a new mathematical model of, of free will that's scale free, quite possibly there. And to your point that about um, it's not dictated. You, there's exploration, real exploration going on. I, I, I would, again, agree that there's real, to the extent that I'm talking about all these little agents having their genuine free will, there's, there's genuine, real exploration going on, even though it's not contradiction to say as well that the one has, has the free will. Hmm. See, in other words, in, in some cases, when we think about things, we think it has to be this or that, but when we look at it more closely, we realize that there's a deeper way of thinking about it in which both can be true and we hadn't thought about it that way. Okay, so if those are deep waters, I'm gonna drag you to the bottom of the Marianas Trench okay. on this one. <laughs> um, does consciousness have a form? Um, I would say awareness has no form, but assumes all sorts of conscious forms. Does, I'm trying to sneak up on, on an idea here and I'm not sure the right way to ask this, but it's like when you talk about the headset is a simulation born of the born of consciousness itself. It is emergent from consciousness. Right. Because the headset 
is so specific and acts in a very specific way. And as I think about AI and the way it pulls images forth out of the possibility space, it does it in a certain way. And you can create different kinds of AI that do it in slightly different ways and they yield different outcomes. And so for the headset that we all experience to be the way that it is, it requires consciousness to be a certain way. And so what I'm trying to get to is when there is no physicality, how does it ever become a certain way? Because mm. the way that consciousness could act would have to pull from a probability space. But if I'm right about that, then math comes before consciousness. And if I'm wrong about that, I don't understand what sets consciousness moving in a specific direction. Well, I think that there are countless ways that consciousness can can create headsets, and it does them all. And so one thing that we have to do to, to, to answer your question, and I'm very interested to do this, but it's going to be hard work, is to actually use the Markovian framework of conscious agents and actually write down a dynamical system of conscious agents that constructs our space-time framework, our space-time headset. Right. So that's how would you, because if there's an infinite number of potential headsets, how would you begin to narrow it down to the headset we actually well, have? Well, so what we're going to have to do is, is, is think about a, a, a really large dynamical system of conscious agents, which will never be close to the big one that we really need to get to. So we're all, we'll always be starting with a system that's big for us, but trivial compared to the one, but that's all we can do as scientists. So I'll have to start with something that's big for me and, and then show it, that it has its own dynamics, which is quite complicated. Now I'm gonna make a smaller headset projection of it using part of the agents that are available in it to, to create that. So there'll be maybe, maybe I'll have like a trillion agents interacting, but I arrange for dynamics of say a billion of them to be creating a particular space-time headset. And then what I would do, so, so I know because Markovian kernels are computationally universal, I can do that. I can use the whole language of, of conscious agent dynamics to create a projection into a, like a space-time headset. I know that I can, it's, they're computationally universal, so I can do that. Now the question is, once I've got that dynamical system and I have some of the agents creating this headset, what happens when I turn that headset and have it look at the whole agent system, and in particular, the part of the system that creates that headset. So I'm taking a bunch of agents and their dynamics is creating a space-time interface, but now I use the interface to look back at the only thing that's available, which are agents. That's all that's available to look at. But I want to look at the agents that were particularly interested, that were involved in the creation of the interface. What will that set of agents look like? They'll look like neurons and brains. In other words, why would they need to look like neurons and brains? Well, for us, for for, for, for that's what. In other words, I'm saying. I thought they didn't map like that. Um, remember, neurons are just artifacts of the of the interface. They're symbols yes. in the interface. Yeah, but pulling from our earlier interviews, and mm -hmm. so we definitely haven't talked about it this time. And maybe your thinking has changed, or maybe I misunderstood your thinking previously. But it was my understanding, I think I was asking you specifically about the moon. And I was like, but there's gravitational mm -hmm. concerns. It can't not represent something underlying. And you said, Tom, you're, you're making a mistake. This is all a simulation. Gravity is a simulation. The moon is a simulation. You don't need the moon there to simulate right. gravity, to move tides or whatever. They can just right. be program rules and that's just how it happens. And I was like, whoa. So right. why then would the the things that create consciousness and thinking look like neurons in my brain it doesn't seem like they would need to map like that well right so the moon doesn't need to exist but but there's going to be a systematic relationship between the symbols in your headset and whatever the software is right there's going to be a systematic relationship between them so uh, that tells me god i'm really trying to guess how you're going to say this that tells me i know this is wrong because i know you don't believe in this but that tells me that there is physicality to uh, consciousness, that wherever it is, that there is some parallel representation, but that 
for there to be a mm -hmm. physical, God, am I help? <laughs> I, I can keep making guesses, but I know that I'm hitting dead ends of things that you disagree with. So what am I getting wrong right now? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure yet. So, um, so, so I'll keep guessing then. So, so okay. Um, what I'm trying to figure out is for the for there to be a corollary mm -hmm. of producing consciousness to actually look like neurons or that oh, oh, I, I'm hung up on the word look like. Okay. Will it actually look like neurons? Well, so consciousness won't, won't look like neur neurons, but the uh, a pr one could build, I'll put it this way, you could build an interesting interface such that when the interface looks back at the whole conscious agent network that created it, it would see that as as if it were neurons and brains mm -hmm. in projection. I mean, so I'm not saying that's it's all projection. It's all projection. So I'm not saying it's necessary, but I'm saying I, I could easily see making that happen. So when we look, when we in the headset smash a brain, look at neurons, we are seeing the representation of what is going on at a deeper level? Outside is it of space time. outside of space time or a deeper deeper level of the simulation? O outside of space time, wh which is a deeper level of the simulation, right? It, it's it's in, in, in. I hope we're using language the same way. The, Probably not, but you're much more comfortable with that. It's that that things are not physical even outside the outside of space time. I see it as it's a maybe different set of rules or something, but that it's still physical. But I accept that. Well, there are rules. Limitation. So I, I'm, there, there are there are going to be rules. Uh, maybe physical. I mean, you know, made out of matter inside mm -hmm. space and time. That's what I mean by physical. Something that's you know made out of particles in space and time. And yeah. By, by hypothesis, the conscious agents are not inside space and time at all. So they're not physical in that sense. They're they are rule governed, and I can say that they exist, even if I don't perceive them. I could say that they they exist. Mm -hmm. Whereas stuff in the headset is only there when I render it. Um, so maybe we're not disagreeing. I, 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 and I'm not saying it's necessary that when you look, use your headset to look at the agents that create the headset that you will necessarily see neurons. I'm saying that we could easily set up a situation or w with some effort, we could set up a situation in which that was the case. Um, in other cases, you might uh, see only a single neuron, for example, if you're a very simple thing or, or some, uh, some other structure. Mm. Um, depends on the nature of your interface. But for, for an interface like ours, so another way to put it is, here's what I think neurons are. Neurons are our interface looking at the conscious agents that are constructing our interface. That's what neurons are. They're the interface symbols, headset symbols that our headset gets when it looks at the conscious agents that are constructing the headset. Mm. That's what's so. Okay, so I uh, asked a variant of this question earlier, but I don't think we ever got to the answer. Okay. So if, as we make all these breakthroughs, um, would you stay inside the headset if you, if you could, you, there were two paths before you. Path number one is you completely exit the headset and uh, inside the, the game world, the simulation, you, your avatar falls over and basically appears dead. Uh, but you are now like out chilling with the consciousness or you return to the consciousness as maybe you become aware of your oneness with the consciousness. That feels like the right way to sum up the way you see it. Yes? Yeah, I think that that idea is, is um, can't be dismissed out of hand. I, I think it's a very interesting idea and I don't have a better one right now. So, so yes, it, the, it feels to me like, um, I'm not my body. My body is just an avatar. Mm -hmm. if, if you're in virtual reality, and you, you see do your feel that. No, I, I would, well, I think that I'll say that what, I'm very much attached to my body. And mm -hmm. if something hurt my body, I would, I would be panicked and so forth. So, so I, I don't feel like I'm not my body. Absolutely. But, but when I'm, you know, thinking intellectually and coolly about things, if something actually happens to me, if I'm in a car wreck, it's a different story. Mm. Um, but but just thinking intellectually about it, and maybe if I meditated more, I would actually feel that way. But but I don't. Um, but it, just intellectually, it seems. I don't know. I'll have to. I'll just leave it at that. Then.
Yeah. So I, I asked that part of it, because what I'm really trying to get to is if you could return to oneness with consciousness mm -hmm. or stay in the matrix, but be like Neo, where now you know how to bend right. it to your will. Would I? Which, which would you prefer? Well, my, my guess is at death, we take off the headset and maybe we lose a lot of stuff that was in the headset, but we don't, but we're still aware. We're, but we're, we're just not tacked into the headset anymore. Um, that's my, my best guess. Uh, and so th there I am completely open to being wrong, deeply wrong. But you know, there are near-death experiences that, that may or may not point to that kind of thing that, that people have. I'm gonna be doing, being part of a, um, I'm part of a film where they discuss near-death experiences. Mm. And so I talk about that possibility in the film from, from this point of view. Um, and and so, so if I were a physicalist, it, it's real clear. There, you know, if the brain is somehow creating consciousness, then when the brain is dead, there's no consciousness. This other view that says consciousness creates space-time and brains as, as just headsets um, has opened to it that... Um, my consciousness, where I put my in quotes, the, the consciousness that's looking through this avatar um, does not perish when the avatar perishes. That, that's certainly open to this point of view. That's not what motivated the point of view, but it, but it certainly is um, open to it. So intellectually, I'm open to the point of view. Emotionally, I fear death. So even though intellectually it seems quite reasonable, um, I have the Darwinian fear of death that's, that's wired into me and may, that's part of the part of the game. So there's two buttons before you. One, rejoin the consciousness. And let's say for now, that really is what happens. So you would maintain a sense of awareness, but all of your sense of self is gone forever. Um, or you stay in the matrix, mm -hmm. knowing that it's fake, knowing that you're in the headset, but you have special powers. Which button do you press? Um, I, I would probably go for the new stuff. I would probably, three dimensions of space, one dimension of time feels quite confining to me. I feel like we got a cheap headset and then this is a fairly cheap simulation that we're in and I would love to see what else is on offer. For example, when I'm trying to solve these ma some mathematical problems, I can imagine a three dimensional shape, but I can't imagine a four dimensional shape. And we had to do, some of the problems we're solving, we have to look at the geometries of things in six or nine or more dimensions, and we can't just sort of imagine it and and figure out what's going on. We we have to crawl our way up to the geometry by theorem proof, theorem proof. We actually have to prove our way. One, so we're like blind men filling the elephant with theorems and proofs to understand the geometry. I would love to have a headset where I could just see in a glance everything about nine-dimensional space, mm. and you can't do that with our current headset. And why stop at nine dimensions? Why not be able to just see in 30 or a thousand or a billion dimensions? Do you though think that inherent in the way that you think about that, it still requires you to be you? Because I'll think mm -hmm. about this a lot. If you've ever seen the movie Freaky Friday, oh, right, right. Uh, I think about this a lot with my wife. Like I really, really want to change bodies with her for... 24 hours so that she can see what it's like to be me and I can see what it's like to be her. I think I'd be a much better husband if I really understood. Probably so, yeah. But the yeah, reality yeah. is the second you change bodies, I would be her right? and right. she would be me. There right. wouldn't be her as me, me as her. Right. And so I, my, even if you're right, here's what I think would happen if you, when you take off the headset. The headset is everything you think of as you. Mm -hmm. And that even if you're right, that you can meditate your way to moments like that where you're just pure awareness. Mm -hmm. um, one, if you're right, all that the consciousness lives to do is cycle through other qualia. So you would either be reincarnated, meaning that you would just pop back up in a new headset because mm -hmm. that's what the consciousness is meant to do is cycle through all this qualia. And so you would refragment yourself back off, you would pop up, you'd be reincarnated, you'd live life again. Um, or, you would return to the Borg, the beehive, the ant colony, however you want to think about it. You would be reinstantiated as just pure awareness. And all of that 
loving and clinging and hating and attachment and precious moments and distance and all that, poof, gone. And I find that when people explore these ideas from a religious perspective, they are forgetting that they're mired in the gruesome reality of the human experience. Mm -hmm. And that to transcend that and be in heaven, for instance, and never experience pain again or whatever, you would be so different. You wouldn't recognize or relate to anybody in the same way. And so I have yet to hear any theory whatsoever other than um, regrowing your biological organs where you actually end up cheating death. Everything else is you die. All of the things you love, poof, go away. Maybe you're exchanging them for something better, but make no mistake, everything goes away. Well, these are deep waters again, but here's, here's another take on it. And that is that if you and I are just the one looking at itself through avatars, the one is learning whatever it needs to learn through these avatars. And that's not lost on the one. It is now part of the one. That, that's, in some sense, eternal. And so the reason I would, in, given the choice that you're asking me to, to make here, uh, um, my own predilection would be to say, let's go for something entirely different now. Because in some sense, that that part, partly because I'm inquisitive, and I would like to, what is it like to live in a five-dimensional world? What is it like? to have um, 20 dimensions of color and, in, and a thousand dimensions of emotion instead of just a few that we have. Mm. What, 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 what is it like? Um, my, my, my feeling is that w we have the training wheel set version right now of this stuff, really, really small. Um, and, and so my guess is I, I, one possibility is that, look, you and I really are this infinite intelligence, this infinite consciousness. That's what we really are. We're peering through, in this case, very, very simple avatars with very, very simple interfaces. And maybe it's the one saying, this is fun, but when I, when I answer your question this way, maybe it's the one saying, yeah, this is great and this is fun, but but there's so much more to explore in different dimensions. Now, I haven't lost whatever I learned in this little interface and I'm happy for the relationships and the friends and, and all, all you know and, and all the things I learned about war and hate and, and religion and and all that all that other stuff, you know, all the things that go on here. Um, but that's only a mere in some sense trivial projection of this entire Cantor's hierarchy of infinities of potential. This is trivial. <laughs> and the potential is mind-bogglingly infinite. And so uh, my attitude, let's get on with it. We, nothing is lost by moving on. And everything is to be gained. This, my, you can see, but again, these are very, very deep waters. I'm not talking theorem and proof here. I'm, I'm now speaking very intuitively based mm -hmm. on the sciences as it is in the very um, initial steps. I, I should be very, very clear. I mean, all of science has been about the space-time interface until the last 20 years or so. We're taking our very, very first baby steps outside of space-time. And so almost surely all of the ideas that we're having are going to look very naive, you know, a century or two from now. They'll look back and go, yeah, great generation. They were the generation that stepped outside of the space-time interface. Hats off to them. But boy, were their ideas so parochial. They, they were shedding the interface, but boy, they didn't really understand what they were really doing. Mm -hmm. That's my guess. All right, I actually want to spend more time in the intuitive, but is there anything from the paper, any sort of grounded mathematics that you think will um, ground people in your theory more in a way that will keep the intuitive exploration from just spinning off into La La Land? Well, yeah, so I'll just say in the paper I gave you, and it'll come out on June 24th, it's going to be made, and I'll, I'll tweet it when it comes If you out. made it this far in the interview, read the paper. Yeah, so it'll be available June 24th, and I'll tweet it when it um, comes out. It might be a couple days before that. I would say that one 
one of the interesting things we're doing in that paper is we're showing how specific properties of the Markovian dynamics of conscious agents map to specific properties of particles like mass, spin, momentum, and energy. And so I'm not saying we're right, but we now have mathematically precise proposals. So, I mean, for example, these are words that won't make sense, but mass is the entropy rate of recurrent communicating classes of conscious agents. And just to be clear, what you're saying you can predict now is particle scattering. This is going to be for, for particle scattering. And, and by the way, the reason I'm going after particle scattering is, is not because I have some fetish for you know high energy physics or something like that. It's, that's the simplest place that we can make our first connections with the interface. Particles are the most elementary things that our interface has. That's why I'm going there. They're the simplest thing. I'm not going for brains first because those are countless quadrillions, trillions, whatever of, 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 of particles. Mm. And, and so that's not the place to start. Let's see if we can get the mathematics and, and the experimental data for individual particles. So, so our paper is proposing, and, and maybe just so that people can show that we're wrong, we'll see. But we have, you know, we say that mass is so-called entropy rate of the recurrent communicating classes. And that has, that then tells us what are massless particles and what are massive particles. And, and, and so we're, we're getting very specific predictions that we're going to be making about momentum and spin and, and energy and, and mass. So, so that's why, uh, so this is where rubber hits the road, right? When I'm talking all this high and stuff about consciousness leading to the interface. Well, the right, the right questions are, so what is, the, what is the mass of an electron? What part of your conscious agent dynamics is going to map into what we call mass? What is the spin? Um, why is there um, a hyperfine structure in the energy levels of the orbitals of electrons and so forth? We're getting hints at answers to those kinds of questions about like the hyperfine structure. So it's, it's, it's really quite interesting. So, so a, again, I, I would be stunned if we're right, but at least we're precise yeah. so that we can now begin the, 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 the whole um, process of, of saying, okay, at least these hypotheses Hypotheses are precise, so now we can try to show their limits, try to prove where they reach their limits, and then move on. Or to show that, you know, this is just fundamentally wrong-headed, there's nothing worthwhile. Maybe our definition of mass is just plain wrong. Mm. We'll see. Um, but it's, it's intriguing. It's intriguing enough that um, I have a particle physicist who put his name on the paper with us. Doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean that he's convinced that we're right. Mm. But we have a real particle physicist who, who thinks that um, it's, it's, if it's wrong, it's not obviously wrong, and it's worth pushing on. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope anybody listening to this understands how the scientific method works. I am constantly trying to tell my team, hey, you need to be fearless in the predictions that you make because you shouldn't hold yourself accountable to always being right. You should hold yourself accountable to always learning and getting a little bit better. So the fact that you're willing to make a precise prediction uh, your paper is full of uh, mathematics and it's there for anybody to check. Uh, so people will be able to help you find the edges, which is something I've heard you talk about and I really respect about you, is that one, you obviously approach everything with humility, but two, you actively want people to find the edges of your hypothesis, your theory, so that you know where it's wrong so that you can adjust and get more right, which is far more interesting, especially if you sincerely want to understand what's outside of that headset. It's like, well, I would rather realize I'm wrong, right. find out how to get right so that I can actually begin to explore that possibility space versus right. think I'm right, but really I'm wrong and nobody ever helps me come to understand why. Um, I, I, really, I really like that and I hope everybody listening takes that on in their own life. I think that that's really important. Okay, so I wanted to to make sure that you had a second to lay out the grounding there, that this is something that you're seeing in particle physics, that there really is a there there to pursue um, because the intuitive space for somebody like me who's not a mathematician, who while I use the scientific method in business, I definitely do not consider myself a scientist, but pursuing the intuitive things, pursuing the thought experiments um, feels true to Einstein's encouragement to all of us lay people to focus more on imagination than um, knowledge, right? To, to really 
understand how to begin to think through these things. So one of his famous thought experiments was that in a falling elevator, you would feel like you were weightless. Right. And that ends up being, it took him years, but he ends up finally putting that together with some other um, ideas that he had intuited, including if you're traveling at the speed of light and you turn on the flashlight, what happens? Um, and in that spirit, you said something as you were describing the um, consciousness and you as an instantiation of that only to go back to the one. And you said, well, the one is still learning what it needs to learn. And I am like a dog with a bone with that idea. What do you mean needs to learn? What, like when I think about a human, right, right. it needs to learn Good. things yeah. to stay alive because it's been given these drives okay. by evolution. Right. But what has set up the uh, the the consciousness that isn't physical right, right. to need anything? My guess, again, we're we're way in over my head, but my, here we are. This might is as well. I like to take you. Um, the joy of exploration. It's, it's just pre-programmed. How it, it is? It's it's just yeah that that the the one is the only thing that there is, but it's infinitely f changing, infinitely, there, there is self-exploration. It's really infinite self-exploration and looking and, and, and enjoying and ever expanding its, its uh, understanding of itself. It's, it's, that would be my, my So you my conceptualize guess. it as still moving towards pleasure. Well, that, that, that pleasure is just, in some sense, um, it's, it's different than an evolutionary thing. So, so an evolution, and, and, and I should say also, concretely wise, different. This dynamics of conscious agents does not need to have an arrow of time. So there's, that's really Tell interesting. Tell me why, because that doesn't seem true. Okay, the, the entropy one can write down a Markovian dynamics in which the entropy does not grow. Uh -huh. Straightforward. But it's a theorem, three-line proof, trivial trivial proof, that any projection of that Markovian dynamics that has no error of time, any projection of it that loses information, say by conditional probability, it will give you new dynamics. It'll, it'll be a projected dynamics of the original dynamics, and that new dynamics will have an error of time because of the loss of information. So the arrow of time, so here's my view. Our experience right now of an arrow of time and of the universe with the Big Bang and, and then the, maybe a big crunch or whatever, or entropy death at the end, that whole arrow of time is not an insight at all into what lies beyond space-time. It's an artifact of the projection. Mm -hmm. And from an evolutionary point of view, right, time is the fundamental limited resource, right? If I run out of time before I get my next meal, if it takes too much time to get my next meal, it's over. If, I, if it takes too much time to get my next drink of water, it's over for me. Time is my most fundamental limited resource. So that limited resource of time is not an insight into reality. That's an artifact of projection from a timeless conscious agent dynamics. And that also suggests all the other limited resources that's all artifacts. So evolution with natural selection is a beautiful theory, but it's the theory of all the artifacts that you see when you do a projection from a realm in which there are no limited resources, there is no competition. But it looks like evolution with natural selection in this projection, it looks like there's an arrow of time. So all of our intuitions right now about learning new stuff, it's gonna be very hard for us because our intuitions are deeply shaped right now by our interface where there's an entropy arrow. And in this realm beyond, there is need not be an entropy arrow. And so wrapping our heads around what it's like in, in, to, to have the notion of exploration where there's no entropy arrow. Now, I'm not saying I have wrap my head around it, but I do know that the mathematics is there that the, the, the Markovian dynamics does not have to have an arrow of time, in the in the sense of an arrow of increasing entropy. So, so, and that's again one of the points of doing science with precise mathematics. I get emails 
quite often from people that I think are, are very, very bright and have really good ideas, and they don't know how to take them and make them precise. Mm. And as a result, you can never surprise yourself. You can never, like, like Einstein, when he had his idea about, you, you mentioned the falling elevator and so forth, and, and so he had that, I don't know, in 1907 or something like that, 1906, and it wasn't, he worked for years to take that idea and make it mathematically precise, 1915. And he, he, he learned tons and tons of what at the time was state-of-the-art, new, fairly new math. It was hard for him, sleepless nights, pulling his hair out, really working hard to take his good intuition and turn. So he finally wrote down in mathematics in, in 1915. And a, a year later, um, a guy named Schwarzschild wrote back to Einstein and said, here's a, a solution to your equations. And they, they predict what we now call black holes. Now, Einstein didn't foresee that. He didn't like it. He didn't believe it. He disbelieved in black holes. He, he wanted to get rid of them. So Einstein's theory came back and surprised him. And that's why it's so important for us to do science, because what we do is we take our best ideas that we have right now, and then we, we make them mathematically precise, and then the mathematics comes back and it slaps us in the face and says, here are the implications of, your, of the ideas that you started with, implications that you simply couldn't think deeply enough about on your own, but the mathematics can take you where your own you know, just consciousness wouldn't necessarily go. And so, so here's one of those directions with this notion of conscious agents. The dynamics need not have increasing entropy. And so our whole intuition about uh, an arrow of time need not hold in this realm. And so when we talk about the notion of explore, consciousness exploring for the joy of it, we're going to have to rejig how we think about the notion of, ex ex for us, exploration is something that happens in an arrow of time. What, is, what does it mean for us? Can we wrap our heads around the notion of exploration where we let go of an increasing entropy kind of thing? I'm not, I don't know if we can. Maybe you just have to let go of this headset altogether to really get that. But is it possible while we're under the limits of this headset to, to wrap our minds around it? We can at least get pointers to that idea. Our mathematics led to this pointer. Um, and I would never even gone there unless the mathematics took me there. So, so, that's, so, so I would say that it's just like you know um, the amateur astronomer with a pair of binoculars can, could be brighter than the guy with the James Webb Space Telescope. But he's never going to beat the guy with the James Webb Space Telescope because the guy's got better tools. And that's what science does for you. You may be smarter than Einstein, but if you don't actually put yourself using the tools of mathematics and so forth, that genius will never actually flower in the sense of reaching all the potential implications of what it, what it means. And so that's why um, we, we do science the way we do it with mathematical precision because for two reasons. If our ideas are good, we probably don't understand all their implications, and so the math will come back and it'll be our teacher. And second, certainly our ideas have their limits, and it's hard for us to understand what the limits are. And in good cases, the math will come back and tell us what those limits are. So, for example, Einstein's theory of gravity together with quantum field theory tell us 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and space-time is over. It has no operational meaning. Who could have guessed? Could you have guessed? You know, could Einstein have guessed? Oh, yeah, I have an idea about space-time, but at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, it's going to fall apart. Not even an Einstein could guess that. Mm. That, that would only come um, through taking your ideas, making them, doing the travail. I mean, Einstein really, it was a birthing process. It was very, apparently, very, very hard um, to give birth to general relativity. And many mathematicians working in, in physics and so forth say the same thing. You, you're working in the dark, it's hard, you, you're, you're struggling, and then all of a sudden, if you're lucky, you get that breakthrough and, 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 and you see things. But then it comes back and you learn the limits of the basic concepts that you started with. And then you reboot from a new set of assumptions. It's interesting that you say uh, about the set of assumptions. So as we explore this topic, I realize that um, I think we still have 
We each have slightly different assumptions, though I think that we're talking well about the topic. But take the arrow of time, for instance. So the thing that I find fascinating about the hypothesis that you put forward is for me anyway, I don't have the math to back it up. It's definitely land of intuition. But what I find fascinating is if you're correct and it's just consciousness is the singular thing, um, it is for whatever reason, joy, need to pursue, desire to learn, whatever, it's right. running through all of these qualia. Mm -hmm. um, and that the tool it uses to do so is this headset. There's an infinite array of headsets, but the one we're in has learned that there's only certain qualia that can be achieved when there is an arrow of time. And that's why I was saying when you first said that, I was like, I don't know that that's true. Meaning inside the headset for at least certain types of qualia, it is clear. In fact, we, we, the only thing we know Mm -hmm. is that the qualia that we have access to requires the arrow of time. We presume that there are infinite headsets that provide just unimaginable, unknown types of qualia. But the type that we have directly experienced all require the arrow of time. That's right. And that, that that's, we've been shaped basically by our headset to, to think that way. And, and if I ask you to imagine a new color, that you've never seen before, mm. you can't do it. I mean, again, it's not because there aren't. I mean, pigeons have four color receptors. Presumably, pigeons are experiencing colors that that no human has could even imagine. And maybe the mantis shrimp is seeing stuff that the uh, the pigeon can't. You know, and and then the birds that see polarization of light. I mean, they're seeing something that I I, I what is it like to see polarization of light? I I, I don't know. It it. What is it like to have infrared vision like certain um, pit vipers? What is it like to actually experience an electric field, to sense an electric field for some fish or creatures in, in underwater? I mean, I have no... What is it like to be a bat doing echolocation? I, I, I don't know. I literally have no idea. So, so these are pointers to me that's... I mean, in, a, in the headset, we get all these hints of realms of qualia utterly outside any, anything that I can concretely imagine. So talk to me about near-death experiences, and then I want to get into um, psychedelics and whether they are simply another form of qualia of what it's like to be a human who's having that experience, or whether that's actually melting the human away and revealing something closer to being the one again. Um, but what can we learn from near-death experiences? Do you think it's a re like a, a sort of half return to the one? Or is it just, well, that's what happens in the headset to the brain when you deprive it of oxygen? Well, from a physicalist framework, clearly the latter is the case, right? So from a physicalist framework, space-time is fundamental and consciousness is a product of the brain. And so any experiences of transcendence of things going beyond the headset um, have to be just the brain malfunctioning in its final throes of death, something like that. Um, but if space-time is doomed, as the physicists tell us, and it's not fundamental, then that leaves open the possibility. It doesn't dictate that near-death experiences are genuine insights into some ex conscious experiences that transcends our space-time interface. But it, it certainly is, is compatible with that point of view. And so I think it's worth, on, on that framework, to explore the possibility um, that there are some insights. And I would take any of those reports like we take any kind of eyewitness testimony, right? With a grain of salt. Mm. And you try to get corroboration and and um, and discount it. But, but, but on the other hand, you don't want to just ignore the data either, right? So there's the, the fine line to, to be open, to, to get the insights, but, but not to, um, to jump on anything just because it sort of fits your preconceived conceptions. Most of our preconceived conceptions are deeply wrong. Um, we thought the earth was flat. We thought the earth was the center of the universe. We thought space and time were fundamental. Wrong, 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 wrong. So, so you were, we're batting poorly. Mm -hmm. So, so anything that even for, if we think that consciousness will survive the death, what we think about that, the way we think about it is probably wrong. And so what we, what we have to do is again be, so that's why I'm being, when I say we're in deep waters here and I'm being very, very careful, it's 
these are things that my theory, our theory um, suggests, but but I don't want to be at all doctrinaire. I think we, what we, I should do is make bold proposals, but they're just proposals. Mm. And the goal is to be precise so we can figure out where the, the proposals are wrong. So, so yeah, so in that spirit, yeah, the near-death experiences may have some good data about transitions out of this interface um, in, that, in that spirit. And are there there's probably commonalities of, of what people bring back? Yeah, there are, I mean, there are some commonalities. Um, there's a lot of reports of you know, going through a, a, a tunnel, a light tunnel, some of like a review, I think Ray Moody or something like that um, is famous for, for um, categorizing a lot of the similarities in, in near-death experiences. Uh, a life review, and then, and of course, the reports we have are people who came back, so then they, they, they came back and so forth. So, so there are, um, there are but, but there are also some that report, you know, horrific. You know, it's just not all, not, not all reports are, are, are great. So um, someone that, that we know personally had a, a near-death experience and was very, very um, pleasurable and came back and has no fear. Of, she claims to have no fear of death now. Um, um, so, I, so I don't know. So yeah, uh, we, I'll be part of the film that's exploring these near-death experiences. There, the, it's put out um, the, the, I think it's the Langone Medical Center in, in New York. There are, there are some cardiologists who are, you know, they, they work with patients who die but the, with, with new cardiology techniques, they can keep the heart and the body in, from deteriorating for quite a long time now, you know, an hour or some, or maybe longer, and then they can bring these people back. And so this film is partly a, a, directed by a cardiologist or a, who, who was seeing so many of these experiences that, that he wanted to document what he's seeing in the ER. You know, mm. And, and um, again, you know, I'm not going to be doctrinaire about it, but I think it's data that, that shouldn't be ignored. And how we should interpret it, we, we should be very careful. Hmm. So if that stuff is real, the prediction that that seems to make is that not only is there a sense of consciousness that remains, but that there is sensory perception that holds out for quite a while. Because at right. least from the things I've heard, people come back with a sense of either it's peaceful or whatever. But that right. means that they were able to experience that and retain it. That's right. That's right. Yeah, this quite, it's quite fascinating. Yeah, mm. that the, again, th this is exactly the right scientific way to think about it. That that's this is data. Maybe if it is data, what does it entail about um, letting go of the headset and and what kind of experience we might exper have afterwards? Mm. And is that just a transitional thing, or is it more, more permanent and so forth? Huh? Right. Right. Dude, that is. So fascinating. Everything that we've talked about today, the research, all of it has, has really made me start to question um, my own thoughts around this idea. The paper's amazing. Where can people follow along with you as you continue this journey? Well, yeah, so I do post on Twitter. At, it, my handle is at Donald D. Hoffman, H-O-F-F-M-A-N, all one word, lowercase. And every time I publish a paper, I put a link to the actual journal article. Um, and then also talks like this, podcasts, anything that comes up, I will post those. So there, I, uh, you can also, um, if, you, if you're a scientist, of course, you can just go to Google Scholar and type in my name. <laughs> if you just, Donald D. Hoffman, Google Scholar, it, you can get directly to, I have roughly 120 publications. Awesome. Yeah. All right, everybody. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. If you want to really go deep into this theme, check out this compilation of my best moments with Donald Hoffman. This gives us possibly a chance to have a language which for the first time ever, we might be able to formulate a precise hypothesis about what we mean by the word God.